All right, ladies and gentlemen, fellow decoders, historians, chronologists, cryptocurrency fans, historians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This has been the moment a lot of you have been waiting for the collaboration of myself, the great Jordan from What Is Above, and the great Jason from Archaics.com. So here we all are, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a long time coming, I think even before the suggestion came about for us three to collaborate. So here we are, and we're gonna get into some pretty hefty, heavy topics. I'm gonna to try to be the moderator and um, ask some questions here. I know that all of you are antsy for us to get started. So here we go. And the first thing that I want to do is hand off the baton to Jordan, because Jordan had a suggestion before we even started this uh, on what made this whole collaboration come about. So Jordan, go ahead, brother. Well, first off, I'm excited to be here with you guys. I think this is going to be an incredible transmission. But this all came to be through a couple of conversations that me and you had uh, privately, as well as from the last uh, podcast that me and Jason did. And we were talking a lot about this upcoming October and just riffing back and forth about our theories. He shared a really heavy prediction. I'm sure we're going to talk about it a little bit today. And me and you talked a lot about the rest of this year, some key dates in May and throughout the year of 2023. So it was just bound to happen for us all to come together and kind of go back and forth and refine our processes of decoding and sort of just uh, have an open dialogue and 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 philosophy about what's to come and how this year is such an important year for the for the world stage. Awesome. Jason, you got anything to add about that? <laughs> uh no, uh he's he's right though. It's uh we're not the only ones that are foreseeing some grand event in the near future concerning either the information technology sector, a huge, a huge change, or maybe some type of reset of the internet. It's a, this is a popular theme across a lot, a lot of platforms right now. And for different reasons. I mean, we all have our different methods of prediction or, or, or basically ascertaining where the direction of events are flowing right now. So this is, a, this is something that needs to be discussed. Yeah. Well, I guess we can kind of move into that area at this point. Jordan and I have done some podcasts. The last one we did was collaborating on the collapse, the financial collapse, the perhaps financial collapse coming. Not to put in fear. This is uh, these are all our opinions, ladies and gentlemen. This is not to institute any fear. We're all loving here. This is to give you an awareness to kind of get mentally prepared for what may come down the pike as we move through the timeline uh, and move towards, you know, this. Uh, uh, these events that happen. Um, you know, Jason, I have, uh, I, I think I'm going to do the Phoenix uh, event part two. I, I got such a big draw. Thanks for sharing that on your channel. Um, astrologically, co the constellations that line up with the 2040 year that you speak about, I've got it kind of pegged around 2039, 2040, 2041. The astrological chart really is something else, man, uh, of where Pluto is at uh, these planetary positions through astrology, really, really interesting, but going all the way back to maybe moving into next year, we can probably talk about the 2040, 2041 a little bit later, but, mm -hmm. um, 2023, 2024, Jordan's really big into the Hebrew calendar. I think it's, you know, probably, would you say it's one of the oldest calendars? I think it's one of the oldest calendar, the, the lunar solar Hebrew calendar. Uh, oh. There, there are multiple versions of the Hebrew calendar. I don't follow the modern one that starts 3761. And this is because, it, I mean, don't get me wrong, calendrics and the start date of a calendar are not the same thing. Let me explain. In the Hebrew reckoning, you, you're familiar with the Shemitah, you're familiar with the seven-day cycles, Jubilees, all that's still real. The only thing I have a problem with is that there are multiple different versions of the start date for the Hebrew calendar. The official version that, that most of the world follows right now is 3761 BC. But there are rabbinical records for, that this was altered in 134 AD 
to basically throw off the Christians from interpreting Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, as referring to Jesus as the Messiah. Instead, the rabbinate wanted people to interpret that as Bar Kokhba being the Messiah in 134, when Rome destroyed Jerusalem the second time. So the calendrics of the Hebrew calendar are still relevant. They're very real. People have whole books and encyclopedias have been published about these cycles and epicycles. It's just the start date that we have a problem with. And it's not, and that's not even really relevant. The actual what year it actually is in Hebrew reckoning isn't near as important as the actual calendrics of that calendar system itself. Yeah. Well, Jordan, you talk a lot about the Hebrew calendar. You use it in your <coughs> decoding work quite a bit. I think really, as Jason said, it doesn't matter what year we're in really we just use these as guides and like signposts and stuff but jordan how important is the hebrew calendar to your work because i know it's huge i said it is but like what in your own words how important is it for you yeah it's it's massive and going back to what jason was talking about like this corruption of the calendrical system and the way that it's expressed ex exoterically it's the same thing with the group with the Gregorian calendar, even down to the names in the months, right? Like you have October being called the 10th month, but oct is the prefix or, you know, octagon. Or we have December being the 12th month, but des, deci is 10. So it makes no sense. It's all corrupted, right? And, but you can utilize that and you could look at it as a decoder and see everything that's happening and kind of apply it for how it could be utilized in your system. So I use both. Um, but when it comes to cycles and the cyclical nature of markets, adding in the Hebrew calendar element was a game changer for me. And um, that Shemitah cycle is huge when it comes to finances and global markets. And if it impacts the global market, it impacts your retirement plan, it impacts your inflation, how much your houses cost, your food costs, I mean, everything. So if you're not ahead of this uh, wisdom, well, then it's going to be formed against you. You know, but it's a tool to have this knowledge and awareness. Even if it's as simple as looking at everything based in seven year cycles, you can get more and more skilled and just dial it down further and further and further until you get to the month by month lunar cycle. So I do like the Hebrew calendar for the fact that they go off that 13 month system, 13 moons. I think that's a much better way of interpreting how markets work. And if you look at the the cyclical nature of the market year by year, going over a hundred years of data. Uh, applying it with the Hebrew calendar and the accuracy that I've gotten from it. So it's it's profound. So I don't just default to the Hebrew calendar, though. I use both. I use yeah. Gregorian system and the Hebrew calendar and uh, so many other layers. Like I know in your work, you have tons of extra layers that you add in, but it seems to be one of the things that I'm more passionate about is the dates and yeah. uh, connecting dates. And, and, and that uh, layer of the Hebrew calendar just expedited the process for me. Yeah. Man, well, I, have I, mean, a, I have an interjection that I, that needs to be said because it is so relevant to what he just said. Sure. You know, listen, of all the calendrical systems in the entire world, you are using the one that belongs to a people who have expressed and demonstrated over a 15th century period their absolute expertise in finances. So there is no other calendrical system that would be better than the Hebrew system because it is implemented, designed, and executed by the very people that basically created the banking infrastructure. So uh, you're using the calendar you're supposed to be using. Yep. Yeah, I, yeah, I, and that's exactly why like, I keep quiet when it comes to other systems because I know what works for my work and... That's why I love Logan's work. I think it's amazing. It's adding on these extra layers that have started to influence me to take it a step further. But ultimately, like, yeah, there there is something huge to to this Hebrew calendar with finances. And you made a great point. Well, I mean, let's go even farther back than that. I want to kind of uh, rub this rock a little bit. Um, and I know, Jason, you've talked about it. Uh, Jordan, I don't know if you've talked about it, but all the way back to ancient Samaria, and we get into another hefty topic, which is the Anunnaki, Anki, and Lil, which I feel is just the dual personality of the Demiurge. But uh, Jason, I'm going to throw this at you, man. You go all the way back to this area in ancient Samaria. Um, and do you think the timeline back then was obviously closer to the source because you're going all the way, you're going way back in time. But 
as we move through the timeline and we get these calendars that change the Gregorian in 1582, but you go all the way back to the ancient Sumer. Do you think that ancient Sumeria was closer to the source, closer to the truth? Or do you think just everything's in the now moment and it doesn't really matter? Well, one, the calendars of the old world all have a, a single common denominator that links them. The Olmec and the Quiche, the Zapotec, the Mayan calendar, the Maya, it's a it's a calendar which is different, different. It's called the Temple of the Cross. The ancient Vedic systems that was all based off 144,000 units, 288,000, 432,000 units. Same as the Sumerian uh uh reckoning. It's it's the you know, the Mayan long count is made of 13 back 13 bactons um that represented the 13 heavens the 13 great epics to the collapse of time each back to being 144,000 days every old world calendar measured time only in two units in days and in moons the concept of a year did not come around until the appearance of seasons seasons did not appear in the historical record until after a major cataclysm that, that, that is recorded in the historical record as the day the sky fell. It's when the vapor canopy collapsed. We know it in the Bible as the great flood. It was after this event that the rainbow appeared. Seasons were now marked. People understood that there was planting seasons. Now they couldn't plant all year long. <clears throat> now there was winters. There was uh, The world had fundamentally changed, but they, they had to implement all new calendars now because the old day count systems were no longer relevant. Now they had to implement calendars that were based off the, the vernal the vernal and autumnal equinox and the solstices. And this is why we have this huge separation of knowledge today, why scholars today are implementing modern understanding of calendrics and trying to impose that on ancient systems, and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Okay. Jordan, you got anything to add to that? No, I mean, that 144 is huge. Um, he just made me realize that 144 three times is 432. Yep. <laughs> We've heard that, uh, you know, a lot when it comes to frequencies. But yeah, yeah that's uh, it's definitely a big number. And it's been following me around lately ever since, um, well, specifically from my work, this is kind of a meme, kind of a joke. But there's this thing called Dogecoin. It's like a meme coin. And uh, that in Gamatria has that 144. 144 is just 12 squared. That 12 is huge. I kind of have been talking about it a lot lately. So he brought that up, and that's well, something I didn't know. I didn't know about that well, uh, 144,000 connection. That 432 is also divided by 108. 108 is one of your power numbers. 108 is one of the most ancient mystical numbers in the East. It was a number, it was a number of great change in one's spiritual life. That's why there's 108 beads on a, on a Buddhist rosary. Yep. But uh, yeah. one of the studies that that we should do sometime is uh the power of numbers. And like like you say, 432 is a combination of different concepts. 108 is spiritual empowerment, but 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 so is 216, which is 108 and 108. So is 432. Yeah which is also divisible by 108. But but 432 also involves the processional number, the great processional clock number, 72 degrees, 72. It's divisible by 72, which is divisible. You know, and you know 432 then must be divisible by 144. So another number you might find in your in your gematria or, or in your numerical studies, water, uh, uh, Jordan, is the number 36. This is the ancient number of the decans. This is the decans system. And, and it was 10 of these decans that made the ancient year of 360 days. So 400, 432 is also divisible by the decans number. So if you were to carry this forward to like the number 864, which is a very unique number, I've got whole charts on that number that show that it is the number that bridges space and time. And that in that uh, there are so many denominators that, that are in 864 that it actually bridges almost every concept that we have in numerics. So when you do a chart, and uh, I hope I'm not speaking too long, but uh, oh no, just be my song. When, when you do a chart, it's very simple how fast you can do this. And I'm telling you, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you something deep right now, Jordan, that you can do yourself at home, and it's going to blow your mind what you see. If you were to take the number 36, 72, 144, uh, 108, the number 153. This is a this is a very powerful number. It's all through scripture too the number 153, and you were just to 
draw a chart showing every single multiple, every single multiple, going all the way up to the number like 6,000 or go to 7,000 or 8,000. It's going to be almost instantly apparent in the columns what your power numbers are because they're going to be divisible by every number across the board. And this, you can even put the odd number of 153 in there. And there's another, the hydrogen number, 105. You can put the number 105, which is 210, and then uh, uh, 315, and just keep going down, then to 405, and go all the way down the deal. And you're going to see these massive collections of numbers that all that are all found in, on this list. And you'll be able to draw a line through them and instantly identify what the power numbers are and in your predictions and then things you do in your daily life. Maybe you can even, you know, I don't understand cryptocurrencies like you do, but maybe you can apply this knowledge. These numbers are the transitive numbers of reality. This is when things happen. So it's very easy. You can do it in a couple hours. You can have a whole chart and you can identify all those numbers all the way up to 6,000. So that, that would probably, uh, would that line up with like a latitude longitude lines, like intersecting? Oh, uh, that you're talking about. I don't, I don't know. Cause I really don't understand how you would apply longitude and latitude to that. Other than the fact that some of those power numbers might be longitudinal or latitudinal. I would have to look at a map to, to know, to know. But it's very simple in the applications. Once you have that, I have that list of numbers. I can provide you the list of numbers, but it's but it's it's it, it's more meaningful when you do it yourself because then you understand that out of the numbers one through six thousand, you're only going to isolate about maybe ninety numbers. When you put those ninety numbers aside, here's the magic numbers for our existence. These are the numbers of the holosphere. These are the numbers when <laughs> events unfold, when they happen. You'll see really quick that ninety percent of all the numbers in reality just fall away to nothing. They're not divisible by anything. They are not important in the primes. They're not important in, in the non primes. They're nothing numbers. Mm -hmm. But the important numbers are the ones that have the most important divisors. Yeah, man, it's 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 amazing. And all the ancient calendars of the world, these are the power numbers in those calendars. Yeah. Well that that, that 108 is really big because when you divide it, when you divide it by two, you get 54. 54 is tied to xenon. Uh in my research goes to NSOF, and then 54 divided by two is 27. That is NSOF. 20 NSOF in, in the Gematria Hebrew is the number 27, which means infinite. Uh, 27 is tied to the word heaven. It's tied to the word currency in Chaldean numerology. So it's really fascinating. And when you go to the 216, when you multiply the 108 times 2, 216 from my research leads to what's called the divine triangle, which sits upon the uh, the White House. And the divine triangle is tied to the, the constellation Libra. Um, <laughs> you, take, you take the zodiac sign, the, the, the logo for Libra, it literally fits right over the White House in Washington, D.C., the wow. two pillars and the and the triangle, yeah. Yeah, I would uh, I would be interested in your you you mentioned earlier astrology, and that because I'm aware, but I haven't studied it. But I am aware that there's a constellation that's not a part of the zodiacal belt. There's a constellation called the Phoenix. Yep. And uh, I know it's in the northern circumpolar area, but. I... <laughs> Excuse me. The more I talk, the more I cough, guys. Okay. But uh, yeah, it's uh, I would be interested in seeing your your astrology on that. It's something I need to look into. I just I've never really had enough knowledge of astrology to be interested enough to explore that. But I'm pretty sure I could find some correlates, just just because the ancients did name a constellation the Phoenix. Well, you're you're in luck because the Phoenix. Let's talk about the Phoenix event. My podcast that you had talked about. Um, I showed that constellation. I showed the map. I showed the astronomy of the Phoenix rising. And the Phoenix constellation sits in between pretty much Pisces and Aquarius. And this okay. kind of seems to be the bridge uh, that Jordan and I talked about on the financial collapse podcast. Well, you, mean, you also mentioned that uh, you saw something peculiar in the carryover from 2040 to 2041. Uh, listen, every single Phoenix year, 1626, 1764, 1902, the big one. Listen, every single one of them, the following year also exhibited the same phenomena because it's not the year as we think. The Phoenix years are from May to May. A Phoenix year is not doesn't go by the Gregorian calendar. 
So when I talk about the Phoenix phenomenon, you're talking about six months of the year of 1902 and then five and a half months of 1903. You follow me? Yeah, That's totally. every year. So yeah, this is what I found. This is why in my in my published books, I, I mentioned the following year's events because they're 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 very Phoenix related as well. These weird resets and edits to our reality, red fallout, may uh mud, volcanoes, liquefaction, earthquakes, things that seem natural disasters seem to be covering up these edits. So yeah. so I just wanted you to know that you're not in error. If you found something in 2041, it's just as relative. Well, 20, 2041 is 241, and that's the 53rd prime number. And 53 is a big number because it's the element iodine, which is the I. I am that I am. And it's also tied to the word Yeshua. 53 is Yeshua. So there is some Christ reference there, most definitely. The phoenix oh, yeah. rising from the ashes. And then, you know, this why I wanted to go into part two is because <clears throat> of the Pluto placement in in that 2040 20 2039 2040 2041 the pluto placement as it is right now uh pluto's going to be in the constellation of capricorn until 2039 and then it moves into aquarius um and right. that is right around that time frame and when pluto pluto's the wrecking ball so and you know it's it's literally in this what's called the nashakras which is the kind of the micromanagers of the Zodiac in the Vedic astrology. And now you have kind of a link to this constellation called Delphinus, which is the dolphin. So you have the Phoenix opposite the dolphin in between the bridge between the age of Pisces and the age of Aquarius. It's, it's really fascinating uh, with your, because I was going on that. I talked to Jordan about it. We talked about it at length about these years coming up 2039, 2040, 2041. And uh, I really can't wait to share. I mean, that's why I'm going to do part two. Well, you might want to add this to your thesis <clears throat> because it's relevant. You just said Pluto comes in like a wrecking ball passing in 2039 into Aquarius. Yep. Aquarius is the sign for water, the sea, the ocean, the deep. All right. In the biblical narrative, the sixth seal in the Phoenix appearance, the end comes in like a flood. Hmm. So I, I can see the associations. This is a, this is in the book of Revelation. The end comes in like a flood. And that's exactly what you're saying here. Pluto comes into Aquarius. Yeah. Well, I mean, it does say in Revelation it's, 21, they'll see will be no more. So I, I don't know if that's... Yeah, doesn't it say something it about the, the rainbow is a sign that there'll no longer be like an, end, an apocalypse by water or floods? That's what it says. Yeah. Right. And of course, it's there's a deeper meaning to this. But when we think about the fact that there could be some superheating, super cooling event, like some sort of, you know, liquefaction, not necessarily seemingly from water instantly, but from her, from uh, well, let's just call it like uh, earthquakes. You know, you can see these earthquakes lead to land liquefaction. Uh, of course, yeah. that would make a lot of sense. Like plasma discharges uh, would lead to land liquefaction, not necessarily just floods, especially by the narrative of climate change. Oh, the oh, way that oh, they try I, to you know what? spread that. Y'all totally lost me. Y'all totally lost me. I was I was over here quiet, Jordan. Like, man, what well, did I miss something? No, I, I was speaking in metaphor. The end comes in like a flood. Uh, was the last the last days and the apocalypse is going to be like as in the days of Noah? Yeah, I, I agree with you 100 percent about the the. The rainbow was a sign that the world would never be destroyed by water again. But in the revelation part, it's metaphorical talking about the end comes in like a flood and like a flood means it's coming in. It's total destruction. It doesn't necessarily yeah. mean it's going to be a watery destruction. Yeah. But yeah, the, yeah. The reference to Aquarius was, was also like metaphor. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's very weird how we have uh, Aquarius being considered an air sign. But I've been talking about this a lot with these April events, how like we have fire and air rituals going on lately in the past 20 years, everything since 9-11, where we had the planes flying into the buildings. And then we have C-19, which was virus spread by air. And it's making me, uh, it's clear as day, these are symbols moving us into this new age where we're removing the old symbols and replacing them with the new. And that's why all of the inside job, all the psyops, all this, all the black swan events, et cetera, they're being done specifically this way. But if you go before that, you'd see they're done by water, like the sinking of the Titanic. And you could come up with so many of these, right? Like you guys are savvy enough. I'm sure you've covered it a lot in your work, but we've moved into now it being more about by the air, 
And uh, to me, it's hard to pinpoint when this exact Aquarian age will be in, but my main trigger point for it to prove that it's here is a cashless society, some sort of cashless world. And I don't know how long it's going to take till we get there. I don't think it's going to come overnight. I think it's going to be like the totalitarian tiptoe, as they call it. But I would say that would be the first key key sign that we're we're there in that new age. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, yeah, me too. Well, you remember that across the way from Aquarius, you have Leo, and Leo's ruled by the sun. Um, so you have the rulers of the astrology, one being Leo, the lion, uh, in across in the fifth house, and then you have the eleventh house of Aquarius, which is seemingly in the new age is Uranus, but it's also cool ruled by Saturn. I say Uranus completely because <laughs> it's kind of the technology and the age we're moving into. So I guess we can kind of move into that, right? So um, what do you, what do you collectively? Because Jason, you talk a lot about the collective and the AIX moving the collective. Where do you think the collective is like, what do you see 100 years from now, or even just 10 years from now, where do you see the collective moving towards that? And do you think that as you talk about being an errant, which means like the black, uh, being a black sheep, do you think there's any way to change that? Or do you think the collective is just going to move it with or without our consent? Um, well, well, first I have to, I have to answer that very, very just great. Get straight to the point. Please do. I am absolutely convinced that you cannot change the world. I cannot change the world. The construct is fixed. I also, at the same time, am absolutely convinced that you can change your world. You can even change the world to an extent of those you come in contact with. But I don't believe that we are here to change or save the world. I used to believe that. And that invites all kinds of psychoses and all kinds of depression. And, and and since I have adopted a totally different idea, the idea of basically leading by example, because telling people the truth never works. By the time by the time they actually process what you're saying, AIX has already saturated them with dungeon programming, got them, got them think you're now you're now you're irrational, you're weird, you're too different, and it's easier to ignore you and just go with the status flow. I believe the collective is the main body of humanity, and they are absolutely enslaved to a paradigm. And this paradigm itself has a personality. It may be an artificial intelligent, intelligent uh network program or a system of protocols i've never been able to say with with any assurance what it is i'm just i'm just confident that it is there is something governing over the collective that that basically acts as a shepherd and they act as sheep and it has problems with the free thinking individual because it doesn't have the the necessary power to ba ba basically govern over those individuals and bring them back in it almost takes too much power to corral them so it just lets them go live their life off because there's not enough of them to ever really change the main reality tunnels that are already fueled they're already set in motion they're already backed up with protocols and subroutines and they're just not going to change and the collective the collective feeds this thing that's controlling all of this but the errant, the individual, highly individualized, immortal soul that waken, that wakes up and realizes this world is not what we think, and realizes that they're a co-creator with something bigger than the, the than this AIX, something something that could, may, maybe that built the construct itself. I call this the oversoul. Once someone realizes that they're actually they're actually a part of the oversoul. That's when I think AIX leaves them alone. They live their own life. Now they're free to just be saturated with truthful information, and those barriers are removed. They can, they can process this information. They don't have a problem with it. We call them truthers, and the rest of the world calls them mad. Okay. What do you got any take on that, Jordan? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead, brother. Yeah. What no, it reminds me of something. It reminds me of something I, I heard where it's like the world, like you sound crazy and the truth sounds crazy in a world full of lies, right? It's very basic, but like that is how you're treated. Like when you, it's, sorry, I had to shut off my my mic because I okay. was laughing when he said, when he said dungeon programming. 
<laughs> I started fucking laughing so hard because I've never heard anyone use that terminology before. <laughs> and it's so it's so spot on. It's like it's a really uh it's a really funny way of saying it. it. Made me think of like Tartarus, how they're like stuck down in the the dark abyss of of nothingness, being used yeah. as an instrument. Uh, you know, and I say this quite often. I think um I use a term like prana where it's like your life force energy and you have this opportunity to to maintain to maintenance your prana and when you tap into your own creative essence instead of just being purely a consumer it seems to be like your whole paradigm shifts like it comes back into this unity consciousness and it's i believe what jason is calling the dungeon programming is like being stuck in duality consciousness where everything is about the right and wrong and left and right and black and white and yes and no and evil and good and if you're stuck in this uh you know we get taught the savior complex so then we try to feel like we have this uh, necessity to go save the world and it comes back to what jason was saying earlier and there's no world to save there's only your world and your life and your script you know they call it scripture that's all it is. And if you follow someone else's script, you're you're being obedient. Yeah. And that's slave programming. And when you f when you figure out that you could write your own script or you could at least tap into your script through your great work of, you know, learning more about the code, well, you start to see there's these layers to the so-called freedom. And I don't even want to look at it that way. Like I don't really look at it like it's an imprisonment or a trap or enslaved or because that's not how I perceive my reality. So once I've gotten to the stage that I operate at right now, I couldn't fathom a, a, a slave or dungeon programming. You know, it, it doesn't exist in my in my realm, but I could see it clear as day when I leave my house. So it's like, it's this, uh, only thing I could really say to this is I've been practicing compassion. You know, I've been trying to compassionate all these moments where I would typically judge the, the so-called sheep or the NPC or whatever people want to call them. I look at them now as an opportunity, like they're an opportunity for me to be grateful for this gift that's bestowed upon me that most, I, I feel even some so-called enlightened individuals or truthers, they squander this ability by just purely being in fear by talking about the food shortage all day and talking about the, you know, whatever end times prophecies, you know, and like, it's fine to be aware, but if you walk in fear in the process, then it's, it's consumed you and you're back into slave mode. So how to like walk this truth and embody this uh, persona that's fearless. And that's where you really become your, your true authentic self. Oh, well said. Well, I, I, you know, like, I think, I think in this reality, you, you do have the, the the night in the day, right? You have this, you do have a duality here. I think you have a yin yang here. And just like the body, when you're a baby, you're born pure, you're born a virgin, you know, you're born with a, a digestion system that's clean and pure and it works great. But as you move through time, you're <laughs> getting weighed down and uh, you eventually will face death. And that's because you become toxified and then the bacteria pathogens take you down, however it is that it looks for you. But I really feel like no matter what, as we all probably can agree here, all that matters is the now moment. It's eternal. It never ends. It just continues to grow. It continues to experience itself, I think. But overall, when this reality becomes too dark, it the positive comes in. Because you can't have negative without positive. That's what creates the battery. So po the positive always kind of wins at the end because if negative won, then there would be the end of the game. So positive has to win, which obviously is love over fear. And love always comes in and wins in the end. And the game, to me, starts over again. And then we have a fresh set of standards, a fresh set of... And this is why, you know, I like your work, Jason, because you go into the chronology, the history, in very deep depths, probably unlike anybody I've seen, where you show these changing of the guards with all these kinds of circumstances happening. And really, the only thing that matters is the now moment. So, but... Um, Anyways, let's let's kind of shift gears. I, I want to ask Jason. I want to ask you, and then Jordan. I want you to uh, chime in on this. What is your take on the topic of the the archons? What well, would you say for Jason? Would you say the archons is AIX? Well, I have described the archons as being protocols that are controlled by AIX. Now, I'm not saying this um, judiciously. I'm not. I'm not proclaiming this as, as actual fact. I'm trying to describe uh, basically something that makes sense to me, something I can make sense of of all this. I mean, it's not just pulling the word archon 
out of our asses here. I mean, we have historical records, and it doesn't mean that they're true, but it means that there was an understanding 2,000 years ago among the Gnostics that archons were deceiving humans. Archons were controlling the construct. Archons were, were basically ruling over the elite and using the elite to do kings and monarchies, queens and all that stuff to do their bidding uh, against the people. We find these scenarios in the Gnostic Nag Hammadi library. In the in the Trimorphic Protenoid text and in, on the Origin of the World text, we actually find a reference to the phoenix and that the phoenix was designed specifically to keep the archons in check. And uh, the phoenix was designed to be a destroyer of the works of the archons. Now, the archons, uh, they, build, they build basically... Uh, I have to return to the whole concept of dungeon programming. It's dungeon programming is like Jordan actually nailed it about the polar polarization. This is exactly what the construct wants the collective to do, to buy into taking sides. It doesn't matter if it's socialist, Democrat, uh, Republican, uh, uh, conservative, Democrat, it doesn't even matter. It doesn't matter if it's Catholic or Presbyterian. They want you to take a side. It doesn't matter if it's Caucasian, if it's black. It doesn't matter. All it wants you to do is take a side because... Because if you're living reality in a reactive mindset, you're going to be polarized and you're going to accept a side and you're going to participate. And by participating in that polarization, you basically become uh, uh, your whole reality tunnel is knit to those circumstances. And more and more data on a daily basis is fed to you that belongs to that paradigm of black versus white or conservative versus liberal. So. The best way to live reality, as I teach on my channel, is to be absolutely, completely objective. And that, that right there keeps you from any control measures of the archons. And the whole Phoenix phenomenon deal is all about, is all about keeping the, ru the rulers of this world from basically 100% totally enslaving humanity. Every time they build an infrastructure, they start their control mechanisms, and every single time they start doing the same thing with vaccines, with corporations, corporate takeovers, new 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 draconian laws. Uh, uh, they start their censorship, and every single time the phoenix comes and starts that shit over again. So they it's serve a purpose, then, though. That so serves do, a purpose in the, in the program. Serve, they do serve a purpose from the content from the context that we are highly individualized immortals passing through an, an experience that we can refer to as a construct. That's why, I, that's why I'm so diligent about telling people we're not here to change this world. Mm -hmm. you, you do not change an obstacle course. Uh, uh, you go through it and you become better for it when you get to the end. I, I love it. Jordan, you got something to add to that? Well, the final thing that he mentioned, I think, is key. It's like, well, you go through the obstacle course one time, maybe two times, 20 times, and you refine along the way, and you just get quicker, more efficient. And I think efficiency is everything. And I look at this whole reality of mining consciousness, as I call it, as how do I save calories? So if I argue with people, I burn a lot of calories. If I debate with people, I burn a lot of calories. But once you become illumined, you don't have any energy for the debate or to prove a point anymore. You just you can quickly determine the frequency bandwidth that this person uh, operates at, and then you can determine how to s save your calories. And I look at everything in this perspective. Like as you get better at something, you just learn how to be less calorically. Uh, you you learn how to be more calorically efficient. So coming back to the archons and whatever's going on with that, I just, I look at it a little bit based in etymology. You, of course, you know, this term comes from the Greek to be the ruler of, or the ruler. Um, it makes me think of like the Lord of the Rings uh, movie, you know, and like all of the movies that we've seen in Hollywood and how they show us of these powerful forces that, that exist in these. Uh... Anyways, my, my, my point on the etymology is, Thinking about our feet, actually, and how at your foot, you have a heel, that's hell, you have a sole of your foot, you have an arch, arch on your foot or an arc, that arc is the archons, it's hierarchy, this is archery, you know, you think about all these words, and that's what I study a lot, and I think that it's all parts of our body, I think an archon concept is just programming language.
So that programming language is something that you have to personally get comfortable with. And the average person doesn't have the bandwidth of frequency to deal with uh, working with this energy. So they just become ens enslaved in servitude to it. They get used for its purpose. And its purpose is solely one thing. It is how do I use this individual for energy, for prana, for life force energy, for whatever word you want to use. So the collective is just the most efficient electrolyte in the battery. They have infinite prana that they could expel through their social media accounts, through their job that they work, through the taxes mm. that they pay, through whatever. There's infinite streams of prana that the so-called elite working class can siphon off this, this energy from. And what Jason said makes total sense. Like, I don't think that these so-called elites or royalty are really in control. They just have control or power because we believe in their power. We elect belief to them. Therefore, they maintain that that so-called hierarchy. And then above them, there has to be something that's controlling them. So when we really, really start to dive into the purpose of life and what we're doing here and how we're operating through this obstacle course that Jason mentioned, it's just up to you on the individual level to learn how to be more efficient at utilizing your calories. That's all that matters. Whether there's a monarchy of royal elites, like pedophiles, like drinking children's blood, it doesn't fucking matter. Whether the earth is flat or round or triangular or shaped like a dildo, it doesn't matter. Like at the end of the day, like the only thing that matters is your reality tunnel and like how you knit yourself, as he said, to this, to choice, you know? And I think that's the most beautiful part of the Matrix movie, how it keeps coming back to choice. When Neo meets the Oracle for the first time, he's dealt with that, that truth bomb, you know, that he's either already made a choice or he's scared of being the one that's in control through his so-called choices. And she keeps fucking with him every scene that they're in. And that's an amazing movie if people want to learn more about the simulacrum. Like I, I can imagine if you were to listen to a couple of my live streams, listen to a couple of uh, Logan's live streams and watch his decodes, watch a bunch of Jason's work, and then go rewatch the, th the three Matrix movies, the first three, it would be like in incredible how different you would look at those three movies. I agree. I agree. I wonder how do we really, uh, how do we talk about... <laughs> How do we get into an esoteric conversation about the about the earth being shaped like a dildo? <laughs> oh, easy. Look where, at what Jeff where, Bezos did. Where, <laughs> look at look at what Jeff Bezos is doing. Uh, I know. Well, I mean, that's obvious that, that whole I mean, A to Z, that's 126. A is one to Z is 26. That's 126. That's iodine. That's I am that I am. That's obviously what Amazon's looking to do. Uh, and of course, that whole that whole company started with books, look. which is all about knowledge. So you get into Sophia look and at their, look at their logo. Yeah. That's a, I know it's a foul. The Amazon logo is a, yeah. is a it's, it's a, a phallus. It's a, yeah. It's people a, want yeah, the yeah. truth of truths. Like all, yeah. all religious symbolism is just phalluses and, and vaginas. That's all it is. Yeah. Like all symbolism is, is coming back to human creation Yep. and human creation requires those two things. Yep. So I know it. some people might be offended by this because they might be ch choosing to have a religion, but you know, that's ultimately the truth. That's why you look at the Vatican, you see what that is. That's a phallus and a keyhole. Yep. Yep. And you had said it, you had said it so perfectly. We had, and we've talked about this so many times about like siphoning off the energy or giving your, your energy away, your chi, your prana. And that's what most people do in this reality. They, I mean, as Jason said earlier, you're not going to change the collective. It's like going out, and looking at the sun when it's hot out and telling the sun to go away. It ain't, it's not going to move for you. Uh, so the collective's the same way. You, you're not going to get out there protesting change in the collective. And I know some people say, well, I'll just get a million people. I'll corral a million people, and then we'll make the change. Well, okay, I don't know how you're going to do that. Uh, it would take great numbers. I think that Jason's right. And, you know, we have talked about this, Jordan, so many times about, you know, instead of complaining, go create. And when you go create from a perspective of disassociating yourself from the mainstream, you then have something very powerful to, to create on. And that leads into the next question, guys. Um, Jordan, uh, just try to make these short here. What do you, what's the purpose of life for you? Life has no purpose. The purpose is life. Okay. Life has no purpose. The purpose is life. Jason, what do you say on that? What's the purpose of life for you? That's not, that sounds very uh, familiar to Lyle Jacobson, a uh, modern philosopher. He said, uh, living is the purpose of life. Correct. But, uh, 
But yeah, it's, I mean, for a more extrapolated answer, I just think that I think we're here to grow, mature, and pass through. I think the ancient concepts of the pilgrim, of the wanderer, and of the wayward son, the prodigal son, all apply to us in the end as the individuals, and that everybody else in the background in all those parables are the collective. And I believe it's as simple as that. That's why I believe Jesus' teachings were very, very simple. It doesn't even matter if the man existed or not. The parables themselves exist, and they are very powerful. And uh, so uh, I, I just believe that the whole reason that Jason is here is to exit the construct with knowledge that I could have only gained by going through the darkness. I would have never been able to learn these things had I not been allowed to trip, fall, die, and do this multiple times. Awesome. What about you, Logan? What's the purpose of life? To create. <laughs> Very simple, man. To create. We're here That's to create. That's a real good one. Yeah. We're here to create, man. That's. What, I mean, this is where you you know you get these people. I don't know, and I used to be one of them, so I'm I'm grateful I'm not anymore. But you know, the Freemason Society, which I'm not a part of. People think I am, but I'm not. The the, the word just means <laughs> a, a free builder. That's what a mason is a builder. So when you put the word free next to it, it means you're building from a free perspective, which obviously would then incorporate free will. So that's, right. that's what, the, essentially, that's what it means to be a Freemason, folks. You, are, you build, you're, you're, you're a creator in this reality. So instead of crucifying these societies, leave them alone. Like they're not out trying to, they're not out there trying to get you. And, every, and if just because you seek some kind of symbolism doesn't mean it's Freemasonic, they may use it. But you should probably pay attention to that because I would say these secret societies, Rosicrucians, uh, the Gord, Olden, Gord, Golden Order of the Dawn, you know, they, they're secret for a reason. And then we can get into cults yeah. and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, this is this is the no, whole but what you brought up is creator. what you brought up is amazing. Go ahead, Jordan. Yeah, it's like it's a really big motivator behind my new decoding mastermind is to show people that all the evil that they're seeing in the world is actually so much more than what you're learning at the base level. Like a lot of this stuff that you believe is evil from the symbolism of uh, the Illuminati or from Freemasonry is actually just stuff that comes back to reproductive organs or parts of the human body. It'll be cross sections of the brain. And you're calling a cross section of the brain fucking evil because you don't know because you just haven't made it yet. Because you look at life through the lenses of duality consciousness, which makes it 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 makes you want things to be good or bad. It makes you want things like in the Illuminati to be the bad guys. But if you look at reality as if they're the bad guys, and that means you're part of a cult because that's how cults work. That means you've chosen another team and your team is superior. So you're working in a superiority complex by default. So it's very egoic. It's egoic to want something to be good and bad or to want this to be evil and this thing to be good. Because, you know, I'll show people without a shadow of a doubt that 99% of the shit that people call evil is just parts of reproductive, uh, the reproductive product. It's just parts of life. This is why I said life has no purpose. The purpose is life. So when you say to create, well, that's part of life. If Jason says tripping and falling and going through the darkness, which I totally resonate with a lot, that is part of life. So just live, and that's your purpose. And you'll see it all flows through such. It's like all light shines from darkness, right? So calling dark bad would be eliminating the only opportunity for light to shine. Yeah. Well, I, I, I had come up with this meme, and I had said that, you know, if you want to be a light worker, you better, you better make friends with the dark, because without the darkness, you ain't got no job, you know, because you can't have <laughs> one without the other, right? And, and so, you know, I, I think this this kind of is going in in a, in a direction now where I want to want to ask you guys or Jason I want to throw this out there because um, a lot of people the darkness and the evil and do you do you think um, do you think there's a way out of this this reality from from your from your perspective? Okay, well, <clears throat> if you were to buy into my model of our existence then you're going to perceive this reality as multidimensional at different states of vibration. 
And that the reason people can be in the same environment and experience totally different emotions is because they're vibrating on different frequencies. The reason why people cannot resonate with each other is because they're vibrating on different frequencies. And the reason why some things feel very, very hard, hard for us tangibly, physically, and we're soft and biological is because it's lower density vibration. So therefore, higher density biology can't pass through it and it feels very hard to us. So... It's if everything is relegated to frequency in, in the physical world, then it's probably in the cerebral, the mental world as well. So we just have a different rate of vibration. So if that's true and the and the lower the lower vibration is phys, physicality, higher up it becomes cerebral, then that means the highest would be spiritual. So if everything is vibrational, then perhaps since I'm just an immortal soul passing through this construct, in order for me to get out of this construct, I need to be vibrating at a certain frequency. And in order to be vibrating at that frequency, I need to learn everything that I was sent here to learn before I can escape it. I love, I love that, man, just passing through. Should put that as a tagline for a t-shirt. I'm just passing through. Yeah. You I like it. You idea. Yeah. Well, I got a t-shirt called yeah. pretending to be human. That's kind of, kind of similar to that, but anyways, um, Jordan, you got a question. Go ahead, brother. You got some, some content. What? No, I was just going to say, uh, it makes me think of the word tourist and how tourist is Taurus and your Taurus ah. field and oh, you have yeah. a Taurus field ah, while good. you're physical. So you're just showing up here, right? Like you're in a, you're in a, you're restarting the game or however he put it, you know, you're traveler. Uh, and I love that concept. It also makes me think of there's this movie that came out. I don't remember the year, but it's called The Boy and His Dog. It always makes me think of the fool card in tarot. But The Boy the boy and His Dog is a movie about uh, clearly a post-mud flood world, like a world that has gone through a cataclysm. That's Don Johnson and it's, when he was young. Yeah. Oh, you've seen this? Yeah, I've seen The Boy and His Dog. It's fantastic. It even has the elite oh, it's so living good. in an underground facility. Yep. It has Dude, what? this movie is so good. It's so good. It has the elite living in like this underground uh, oh, yeah? part of the world that he he finds out later. And and you could see the movie kicks off right away with with uh, the world just being compacted in mud. Um, there's been many movies way more Hollywood level than this, by the way. This isn't as common uh, of a movie that most people have seen. But anyways, I think about the boy and his dog and just being a traveler in a in a part in a in a phase of reality that perhaps maybe we've traveled through before and that's why it resonates with us when we come across this gnosis yeah um all right so let's let's throw this out there to you guys my, my research at this current stage i have a new decode coming out prison planet part four um the series of mine and man i gotta tell you guys my whole world's turning upside down with this research um and it, and it seems to be like if you study vedic astrology you know, the Indian astrology, which I'm a huge fan of, probably the most important body uh, above us is the moon. Besides the sun being the spirit, our soul, it's the moon. And the moon through Vedic astrology runs the mind, the subconscious, the emotions. Essentially, it's kind of like the hard drive of earth, if you will. Um, and it, it seems to be perhaps... Um, I, I could even say that it's tied to what's these words called black sun. The moon doesn't give off any of its own light. And so I'm, I'm kind of, there are some ties to Lucifer here being the moon. I had said this a while ago, many podcasts about the, the moon being a burnt out sun. It used to be a sun and then it burnt out and then a new one popped in and you have the, the logos, the sun now, but, but the moon seems to be through this prison planet four, it seems to be perhaps running this reality. And then you get the reference in the Truman Show, Kristoff being on the moon, wanting to run Truman Burbank. And Truman Burbank decides to leave and exit the Matrix. And the story is as it goes on. But um, Jason, the moon, like, what is that to you? What, what does it mean to you, the, the moon being a construct outside this reality or, or in, in the firmament? Well, <clears throat> in the 1950s, the Russian scientists published a series of very compelling arguments because their own conclusions about the moon was that it was hollow and that if it's hollow and that the surface of the moon shows the evidence of mining and they showed close up pictures showing where they believe that there were facilities on the moon in ancient times, not any time in, in, 
Now, in Ru Russians concluded that the moon must be, must have hollow cavities that are probably the the size of large cities on Earth. And if that's the case, then uh, uh, the moon is probably a super construction that was put here by a technology that's far superior and more ancient than we understand, and that something deliberately put it in our orbit. This was the conclusion of the Russians based off all the data that they could compile. Now, I'm not saying I agree with that. I'm saying that they they understood there were enough anomalies to come up with a theory like that. So, uh, I'm under, I understand from the writings of, of Hans Boringer, a, Viennese, a Viennese engineer in the 1800s, uh, his research was followed up with by Hans Bellamy in 1901 and 1902, and it was cited by Emil, Emmanuel Velikovsky in 1950 in Worlds in Collision. And the conclusion was the cosmic ice theory, which was the our the extra moisture and water that we have in the two mile high ice caps at the northern and southern extremities of our world was was explained in a cataclysm the day the moon appeared. It's called in the in the historical record. It's called the capture flood. So, and it said that the moon was covered in an ocean, and it came too close to Earth, and Earth took its entire glacial sphere, ripped it right off the planet, and it start was a huge cataclysm to us. I'm not saying that's the truth either. I'm telling you this is a very popular theory that was expounded in the late 1800s all the way up till 1930s, and this is the cosmic ice theory. Now, you just proposed something that makes sense to me, though, and the moon is a is a burned out sun. The reason this makes sense to me is because I'm privy to a lot of research showing that the moon is holographic and that it has, it, it has been seen through before. And our own sun act, acts like it's holographic, not a solid. So we have traditions that our world began with a two sun system, just like Star Wars. Uh, Luke Skywalker's home planet shows two suns in the sky. One is close up and one is very far away. This is the exactly what we have with the Nemesis system. The original Earth system was the Nemesis system. It had two suns. Then one sun collapsed and it left us with, it left us with a day star. And the other sun, the other sun collapsed and didn't give light anymore. There was a cataclysm, and the world was covered in a vapor canopy for a very long period of time. And only after the collapse of that vapor canopy did people see that moon in the sky. This was so. I don't know. I'm not saying which one is true and which one is not. I'm saying mm -hmm. we have, we have so many different theories, and they're all supported with very good evidence. So I don't know, but it does. It does make sense that the moon could be a burned out sun because we don't even really know what the hell the sun is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the mountains and the mountain ranges across the world, I mean, you had mentioned the two suns and are we going to see the moon collapse and will it fall to earth? And as it doesn't, it breaks apart. It will form the new mountains. And is that how the mountains got formed last time? Cause you have a lot of flat land and then you got these huge mountain ranges and, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But is the is the mountain ranges remnants of a fallen moon slash star that was here before? And are we just going to see another sun come in, and then the sun we have right now will just be a partner of this new sun coming in, which is going to get into the Hopi prophecy and the return of the the blue kachina, right? The Hopi prophecy. So that's kind of interesting there with that. But I mean, the moon to me at this point um, has a lot of merit in running our minds. I think. I had done a decode on the the water cycle and the water cycle was tied to the number 42, which is tied to life, the universe, everything, uh, Douglas, Douglas Adams um, book um, and series that he has on uh, the number 42. But it was all about the sun, the moon and earth. And that trifecta was creating our reality. And the earth was obviously being fed by the sun through photosynthesis without the logos. And then the moon is all about the condensation. So the, the sun evaporates, the moon condensates, and then it, we have precipitation. And then we get the rain cycle, the water cycle. And I feel like that's kind of maybe how the incarnation reincarnation process works. Um, but that's of course, purely theoretical. Jordan, what's your take on all this with the moon and all that? So back in 1965, there was a professor, Roy Foster, who was actually interviewed, and he was asked about the moon. He was talking about how the moon is not something we could land on. It's not physical. He basically called it a plasma phenomenon. 
And this resonated a lot with me when I first heard it. So this plasma phenomenon thing, you know, it sparked a lot of interest um, into what are the luminaries what are the planets what is this stuff that nasa shows us you know that was, i'm talking about a while ago is when i first heard about this theory a, a counter theory uh to what the moon could be of course we have the traditional 1971 so-called moon landing a lot of us start our conspiracy days in that one uh you know so beyond that that was the first time where i was ever blown away by a concept and uh, anyone could go look this up it's just you type in plasma moon scientist and you'll find it on youtube it's pretty common um so that would be my first like it's kind of esoteric but not really it's a good starting point for people to just get going on a theory that what is this moon but for me i'm looking at it purely simulation i i think everything that we're looking at in the night sky is an optical illusion i think that our eyes are horrible at making determinations of what we so called are uh, seeing or perceiving anyone who knows about the bandwidth of frequency that the human eyes can see it's so limited so when we start making conclusions on what we perceive through vision uh i think we're not the species to be cons counseled on you know consulted on such a thing it's just we're we're too limited in what we could in what we could see anyone who's taken psychedelics also knows that you can increase the bandwidth of what you see with your eyes by taking uh psychedelics so i i started there with me just being uh, curious as to what these things are but i do not believe that anything happening outside of this firmament or even uh in our sky that is so-called physical i don't believe that it is I look at the sun as a portal at best. It's probably a black hole portal and a wormhole maybe. And with this moon, it's potentially a optical illusion reflection of this of the, of the physical realm. I'm very open to that theory. I'm not committed to it. I'm not committing to really any of this, but I'm I'm very open to the idea that this moon that we see in the sky might actually be a reflection of this entire physical realm that we're living on here. I do not believe in planets. I don't believe that this is a globe. Uh, I don't think we're a ball spinning in outer space at a thousand miles per hour with curved water. Um, so yeah, just all of this stuff together has been making me uh, not conclusive, but but definitely I know where I'm not going to make my commitments. Um, outside of that, whatever this moon is, I think it's tied to matter. So this is the final thing I'll say. Um, when you look at some Freemasonry symbolism, you could see the two pillars, Yaquin and Boaz, and you have your moon pillar, sun pillar. On the moon pillar, you see the globe, this thing we call Earth, right? And you think of the words here, which is what I love to do, just go into the etymology. You have mother, which is mater, which is, again, coming back to matter, moon, ma, this is all coming back to language and language spells. So I believe that whatever this moon is, it affects physicality. It affects the matrix. It affects this place. And 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 thinking of the word matrix, this comes from the French word matrice, which matrice means womb. So womb is your moon from the womb to the tomb, right? Moon. It's all word word spells. So yeah, I mean, whatever the hell that moon is physically, I can cut through it all by saying that I do agree with what you said, Logan, that it controls the mind of man because the mind of man for the average uh, person in the collective is purely material. It's a, per it's a person who believes in a physical reality, that they are a physical being, whilst I look at myself like a spiritual being having a physical experience. The average person believes that there's almost no spirituality to this, and they're purely of the material. So it makes total sense to me when we have a full moon, why we have increased violence, crime, yeah. people, you know, you ask people who work at prison, uh, at the prison yard, what's going on there. I mean, maybe through personal experience, uh, Jason might be able to chime into that. Like, what's a full moon like uh, in the prison? Uh, has Have you noticed anything like that? Or is that not necessarily the case? Is that just a, a fable? Okay. First of all, I have to interject with something very, very important. Oh, he's pulling out the book, man. No, I'm not. <laughs> oh, he's got okay. <laughs> this is Eagle. Important. This is Eagle Rare, aged ten years, Kentucky straight whiskey. Now, I have to do a demonstration. Are you? Oh, you're gonna do a shot for us? Now, I'm gonna tell you now. <laughs> what you just said, Jordan, about the whole space being just a. a 
a show and oh, all that and all yeah, the yeah. every one hundred percent agreement, man. One hundred percent agreement. Oh, he's doing a shot for it. Okay. I love it. <laughs> I love it, man. Yeah. Listen, man. Space was made in a Hollywood basement. Uh, so you're you read out chili peppers. Me and me and Logan that. talked about that quote. We talked about it. I need, like a podcast. So I need to just bring to your attention something. It's just so it's so comical once the, you once you process all this. Listen, 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, even up to the 90s, all the textbooks were 100% putting out this information that we can ascertain the chemical composition and the mineral composition and the metal uh, compositions of luminaries based off the spectrum and the colors. So telescopes were based off the separating the colors and the spectrums. And with the advent of using computers in the late 70s and then 80s and 90s, a massive amount of astronomy photos were CGI'd using software that translated from numbers that were attached to different colors in the spectrum. People don't realize the pictures they're looking at in all these astronomy books are not actual photos. They are CGI'd reconstructions based off number pattern patterns that are programmed from sequences that are given to get that's given to fed into the program based off the colors that these spectrographic telescopes are reading. The telescopes aren't looking at planets. They're not looking at stars. They're looking at all the different colors. And then they have this this system, they have the series of chemicals and minerals and all that. And those numbers get basically tell them based off the color, what the stars are made of. Listen, 100% of our astronomical data came from this model and they published all these books based off this. And then in 2004 and 2005, astronomers very quietly admit that cosmic dust going through the, the, the galaxies and all that stuff alters the colors that their telescopes receive, but not one person has come forward and say, well, hell, we all going to rewrite all the books. Are y'all going to rewrite all those books? Cause uh, you got everybody believing that these stars are made of this and this. And because of the colors, you, you can even, you can even cite the distances and all that. When astronomers in the 1890s were already baffled because they published it widely. They took pictures of the stars from three different observatories in the month of February. Then they waited till July when the world was supposedly 186 million miles away from where the first pictures were taken. And they took a series of pictures from the same three observatories on three different continents and couldn't see any evidence of parallax whatsoever. As if, as if we're looking at the bottom of a dome where the lights are fixed and there's not actual distances between them. So basically, I just want to tell you what what, what you're describing is absolutely ba- is absolutely backed on factual data, and everything that that NASA puts off in all these textbooks and all these collegiate works and scientific books, every bit of it is based off the software that was designed to break down the color spectrums and then put out what the minerals and co- what the minerals and what the chemicals are in those stars and then tell us their distance of those stars and tell us how big they are and tell us what they're made of that therefore yeah. how old they are and that same data was then used through another series of algorithms that that then guesstimated how many planets it, it developed because of its age the entire model is a mathematical construct that was invented that's a really interesting. That's right. I mean, I, I've watched countless amateur astronomy videos with their telescopes, and I've seen, you know, Saturn, Jupiter through these telescopes. They're not NASA at all. Um, so there's that, right? But let's just hypothetically say that you guys are are correct. There, there is no. There is no planets. There are no stars. This is all just a holographic projection. Um, then people would say, "Well, how how does how does astrology work? How, how does it how does it become so accurate? And how does it really define our reality?" At that oh point? man, I'd love to answer that. Go, well, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, well, check this out. There should be no attachment to an idea that just because the stellosphere isn't what we've been told in the past two hundred and fifty years 
automatically negates the fact that for thousands of years, astrology has recorded and been able and used with predictive value. These are two independent systems. We should, we should not merge them only because we find one is incorrect. The stellar sphere is real. The luminaries are real. In the book of Genesis, it's very real. The stars were put up there to tell us the times. Okay? The original calendars were all were all concerning the turnings of the stars. This is also in Genesis. In Genesis, it, the very first timekeeping method was in the evening and the morning was the first day. Because in the ancient Bronze Age, the day began when the sun went down. This is why the this is why the Hebrews have have that as their model today. To the Jew today, the day begins at sunset. It's not like the rest of the world, but the Jews still maintain that ancient Bronze Age cult, uh, cultural idea, which is reflected in Genesis. The evening and the morning is the first day, and then God made the plants and the animals. In the evening and the morning was the third day. Then God made mankind in the evening and the morning was the sixth day. And then God rested from all his works, what he thought was good. In the evening and the morning was the seventh day. Genesis is very specific. All the old calendars were based off the stellosphere, and it was all the turnings of, of the stars around the dragon. Because in the ancient in the ancient concept, the only star in the sky that didn't move was Alpha Draconis. It's the eye of the dragon. It's the only one that didn't move. And the whole dragon spun one time a day. <laughs> the whole dragon spun one time a day. And that's why the ancient Chinese calendars numbered all their days in dragons. Yeah. When this emperor reigned, he was, it was 400 and it was 4,322 dragons. That's all it was. It was just a turning of the stars. So when I, the, so in answer to your question, Logan, it's, no one should associate the fact that we've been misled as to what the stars are and think that has anything to do with discounting the predictive value of the ancient science of astrology. They have, they're not, there's, there's no, no, there's no correlate here. One should not negate the other. Astrology is ancient. Our understanding of what the stars are is very, very new. Mm. Well, I mean, my whole thing to postulate this is that, you know, because, ideas you know this what's in psychology it's called self-fulfilling prophecy taking an idea sharing it with somebody else and saying oh yeah i like that idea and then as a group you share it with somebody else and oh yeah that's a cool idea and next thing you know you have a following of people that share these ideas and you project these ideas out onto the world stage and instantly and automatically you create what's called magic and spreading the word through magic and spreading the word through expressions of what it means to be a human being so when you have thousands of years of this going on potentially hundreds of years going on even if we go back like i'm 50 so if i go back 50 years of the existence of human being species, you have these ideas of people projecting what it means to be a Capricorn sun or a Gemini sun or a Sagittarius sun, what the remnants mean, what the description means of having Mars in a certain house. These ideas are spread through by magic. And when you spread these ideas through magic, you end up creating an idea that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And next thing you know, you now potentially, I think this has the base fundamental of shaping our society through magic, that is. And that is just people agreeing upon a set of definitions and saying, yeah, that really, yeah, that rising sign in astrology, yeah, that totally resonates with me. I mean, I mean, me being a fan of astrology, a student of astrology, when I go read about myself and I define myself through the rules of astrology, I start to resonate with that information. And the only thing that makes sense to me is that um, the ideas throughout, however long this has lasted, um, it, it potentially grows, it grows, it grows, it becomes stronger. And then is it creating and defining our reality based upon these fundamentals? That would, that would be the big question I would have. Are, are the uh, collective ideas of astrology, numerology, all the esoteric sciences, are these ideas that people have been projecting through the expressive natures of our five senses, through time, has that defined our reality as a species? And really all that matters is the now moment. What do you, what do you say on that, Jordan? Well, I think what we're discussing right now is belief. And I look at belief like a technology. And there's this critical scene in The Matrix. I think it's in the end of the first movie where Neo is starting to fight back against Agent Smith. And you see Morpheus kind of go in front of the camera and he says to Trinity, he's starting to believe. 
And at that moment, you see that Neo like truthfully embodied the one. And he started moving in this speed that he's never moved before. And he started really tapping into some like superpower level wizard shit. You know what I'm saying? So it's like belief is everything. And if you believe the earth is round or flat, or you believe that the stars are real or they're not, it's really whatever you take on. And and that belief like plasmatizes itself into your uh, reality tunnel. So I could just say that, you know, there's no difference believing in Jesus or believing in Muhammad or believing in flat earth. Like if you decide to make that choice, it becomes that for you. And then you take on that truth and everything is built around that. And if you have a really damaged ego, you will fight to maintain that truth and everything else that goes against that truth will be your enemy. And that's a really problematic place to be uh, if you're trying to expand consciousness. Consciousness doesn't have room to expand if you're making th those sorts of decisions. But getting back to like maybe a more esoteric concept and built on the holographic uh, nature of the realm and what we could be seeing in the so-called sky and in outer space, I was thinking of the black sun, right? Sort of like a Tesla coil. And if you think of the noble gases, when you pass the Tesla coil under the noble gases, you see the colors change. So those seven noble gases can be compared to the seven days of creation with what Jason was saying. You have helium, which is Helios. You have neon, argon, krypton, krypton being secrets, krypton also being the 36th element. That comes back to what Jason was talking about earlier about the importance of the number 36 and multiply by two. You have 72 multiplied again up 144, et cetera. Then you have xenon is 54, radon is 86. And uh, Oganison is uh, 118. OG. Element. That could. <laughs> OG. The OG. Original man. gangster. The original baby. gangster element. Yeah. So you you have to think about this stuff is uh, this black sun. Uh, I know me and you, I don't know if we spoke about it in a podcast, but I talked with, with you privately that I believe the black sun is Pluto. So you asked a question, Logan, about the. Uh, the truth of the astrology, perhaps, or like, what is the what what is the truth of the system? And. I kind of look at it on a deeper layer that the truth behind astrology or astronomy is mythology. And that's been why in my work, I've kind of skipped looking at the astrology charts and skipped all of that stuff. And I went straight to the mythology. And I feel like once we become a physical being, we become coded with mythology. So there is a Jupiterian aspect to all of us as much as there is a Cancerian aspect to all of us. You could even go into the Zodiac, right? Like there's a Piscean aspect to us as much as there is a Sagittarian aspect to us. Yep. And you could chop it up all day. And uh, what what Jason calls an errant is what I have always called a divergent. You're just like a glitch in the system. Like you take on all aspects. You're okay with taking on all aspects as well because you feel like that selecting the duality route feels like enslavement to you. Like that obedience to the duality route, like if it's holding you back and you feel that at the core of your soul. So I like that divergent uh, term, and I believe it's pretty much the same thing that Jason calls an errant. And I'm looking at it now, like, you know, uh, when I started to think about the periodic table and the noble gases and passing a passing this tes Tesla coil beneath it and looking at a sunrise and sunset and what it is. And you think about this, cons uh, the term Lucifer, son of the morning. You know, you think about the morning sun, the land, you know, the rising sun, it's called rising Ra's Ra. Radon, but radon. What? Radon. And you can look clearly when you pass a Tesla coil under the noble gases, you can see the change in colors. And it is the same exact change of colors in order of the noble gases as a sun is setting on the horizon. It is the same. You will see the same color scheme coded perfectly so the periodic table is exoteric but in actuality if you apply it in this fashion it's revealing to you what this realm is like it is just a big uh it's just electromagnetism and that sun that we're perceiving as the sun that we call the sun it's so much more than that it might even be cool to the touch for all we know it might not even be a ball of light it might literally be just a black hole and it's flashing out light you know i'm, I'm open-minded to all this shit but when I started to look at the etymology, and this is where I'll wrap it up. When I started to look at the etymology, I was thinking how Lucifer is called the son of the morning. This has to deal with the rising sun, of course. Jason was talking about how the day in Hebrew is technically starting at the setting sun, that is Set or Seth, coming back to ancient Egyptian mythology. 
this being like your your figure of confusion or chaos is when you enter the nighttime that has to deal with set but when you think of the rising sun and, and lucifer being the sun of the morning and then i think about helios or apollo helios hell is low or apollo apple is low it's talking about low like it's talking about this rising sun could it just be that we've been we've been indoctrinated to believe that this sun is the sun we call the son of god which has always been given a positive aspect but in actuality it's all tying back to something that is a little bit more draconian like a little bit more uh, negative i mean i don't necessarily look at it like a positive and negative but it is such it's like it's to create balance it's to create this positive and negative force which ultimately leads to balance um so yeah there's so much to say on that but it's been a lot of what I've been thinking about lately. So I'm glad we're talking about it because I've been wanting to riff out these ideas of the noble gases and what the sun actually is and what the stars actually are. It's been why I've been so apprehensive to get into astrology in the typical way that people do. Mm. Uh, really, really good points. Um, so let me, let me throw this question out there for, for either one of you, Jason, I'll throw it at you first. Um, I know, you know, a brunt of your work is this is the AIX, which um, is obviously connected to the collective. Um, but the question I would have is the voice in your head and anybody listening right now, you got a voice talking in your head and you've been talking throughout this entire broadcast, maybe saying, oh, he's full of shit. I don't agree with that. Um, where for you, Jason, and then Jordan, where do you where's this voice coming from? Okay. Um, and is it connected to AIX with your concepts? Until I had come into contact with the writings of Ishak Ben Tov in uh, a brief tour of higher consciousness and stalking the wild pendulum, Great I had never ever entertained the idea that some of my own thoughts are actually me just absorbing information that's in the thought field. And the, the whole concept floored me. It actually redirected my, my whole focus. I had to stop what I was doing for a while, process that, go through my research notes, and, and it made so much sense. And I started viewing reality totally different because in in the model put forth by Bentov and P.D. Alspinsky, their model is that reality is a thought field and the, the information is already out there. And this is why different inventors come out with the same concepts on three different continents at the exact same time. And, and this has happened multiple times in history. It's not mysterious. It's the fact that those three individuals just happen to be vibrating on the same frequency as that thought that was passing through the thought field. So this, uh, learning how to understand, basically learning how to recognize what you're thinking as opposed to invasive thoughts that are in the field that you're absorbing it to me is is a task but you can do it you can do it really easily there's been many times when i'll i'll be thinking about something and it has nothing to do with with a thought that just just injected into my mind and i'll process that it's like why would i even think negatively about this person I don't, I am, I have never been either here nor there about this individual. Why am I even thinking about this individual at all? I'm thinking about this over here. I'm reading something and this just pops in my mind. We, so when you learn to recognize these things, uh, you can, you can better tell that there is a thought field that we're immersed in and that you can actually learn not by virtue of reading books, not by virtue of experience. You can actually absorb information by coming into contact with it, being receptive to it. This is where, this is where common sense and wisdom come because it's inexplicable how some people who have not had the experiences have yet acquired a tremendous amount of common sense or, or wisdom. And they haven't even lived long enough to have that type of wisdom, but they do. These people are more in tune to this background of information and they learn by virtue of osmosis rather than experience. And uh, I'm not one of those individuals. I'm hard headed. I always fall before I get back up and, and realize I just learned something. That's how I've been all my life. So, but I know people who are just the opposite. So, uh, Ishak Bintov's model resonates with me. I understand that when we meditate 
in whatever form you perceive meditation to be. But when we meditate, uh, we, we can clear our mind of actual personal thoughts and almost instantly a sensation of motion comes over us, even though we're not moving. But if you close your eyes and you're sitting very still in a very not, not, it doesn't have to be a dark room, but just something with no light is a distraction. And you close your mind and you just totally try to erase all present present thoughts and all any projections, anything, almost instantly you're going to start thinking about all kinds of things. They're going to be absolutely random, but you're also going to feel a force of internal motion. And it's not you moving. You're tapping into the thought field and it's moving. You know, his, his concept floored me and I believe it 100%. Ben you know, Yes. Ishak Ben Yeah, no, he's great. His concept absolutely floored me. Uh, I'm a student. Uh, it led me to, to, uh, PD Alspinsky. So I'm, uh, that's, 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 that's as close to an answer I can provide you on that right there is that some thoughts are not our own. There is a thought field out there. Would that be AX? We, we can tap into it. Well, hold on. We can tap into them. But often it has nothing to do with artificial intelligence X. It has nothing to do with the reflective medium of the construct itself, which I call the simulacrum, which is properly pronounced simulacrum. I just can't, I just won't say it. I, I've been doing it too long my way. But the truth is, <laughs> the get, truth is hey, the truth is, I'm now of the opinion that I'll give you an example. A woman and I were having a conversation about another woman about three days ago and the woman we were conversating about, I have had no contact with at all for three years, but it was a memory I was sharing and I'll be damned the next day after I was talking about her, she popped up on my phone, blowing up my text, acting like no time had passed in the last three years. Listen, the thought field is real, but because time and space are actually illusory. They're not real components of the spiritual world. They're only modulations of the physical experience. So in the thought field, she felt us talking about her and was instantly thinking about me because she knew where the thought came from all subconsciously. And, 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 and then she texts me and this happens over and over and over. We are constantly we are constantly drawing other people to us just by either thinking or talking about them. Because in the thought field, that every single thought that you have and everything that you ever physically say, it is broadcast throughout the entire holosphere, which no, it's not a restrictive medium. It's, 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 it's a conduit, meaning Jordan can be in his own study surrounded by his research and his books in front of his computer, not another human around. And Jordan can talk to himself about something rather deep, rather deep. And within two or three days, things that he spoke out loud, which echoed throughout the entire holosphere, which knows no restriction. Now, all of a sudden, those little tiny variables start popping up in his life. And he calls them coincidence. This happens to us all the time, man, yeah. all the time. Yeah. Um, but, but, okay. So you, you, have, you, it's interesting because the, the collective, um, this, this thought field in the, in the Egyptian book of the dead, they talk about the net. So it would be essentially, I look at it. I think it's like everything's inside the net, the web, the matrix, so to speak. And it's, and so when you go through these ages from golden age to dark age, when you get to the dark age, um, there's there's so many thoughts that have been shared over the course of that time. It becomes very dark, right? The the the, the thought field becomes so murky and wa and dark, and the yeah. energy is like it's so heavy. And that's what it seems to be on the world stage for a lot of people. I mean, you know, that's I, what the news so, does. That's what the uh, news, CBS, NBC. Yeah, says. that's the job that's of the, that's exactly that's what right. The news does. The that's news. dirty laundry. Yeah. Yes, the news is basically speaking fictions and turning turning me turning them into fact. On yep. my own channel, I call this spiritual alchemy. Yep. It is the assertion of a fiction that is known to be a fiction, but it is promoted as a fact to yep. a why to a large body of people who absorb that information, and then their belief in that data turns that fiction into a fact. Yep. That's the gas, the prana, the, you know, that we, Jordan and I have talked about this a lot uh, separately and together. 
Um, Jordan, what's your take on it? The voice in your head. Where's it coming from? Yeah, you know, I tapped into this uh, through playing guitar. So I probably talked about this a little bit, you know, my live streams that I'm a musician at like at heart. It's my main passion. And uh, one time I was playing music, I was I was writing a song and I had this like really emotional moment where I realized that I didn't make that song, that it like I remembered a song that I already wrote before. And that was a, a huge shift in my reality. Like I, I completely changed my whole essence about my idea of what creation was. And although it felt novel, like it felt like a new stimuli, it felt like something that I was putting together that was in real time. And I actually, in my heart and like deep within me, I had this, I had to admit that no, like this wasn't coming from me now. It was coming from me or something from somewhere else. And I felt that, you know, and it was a really weird experience. Like I really don't even know how to put it into words because it's beyond human comprehension. Like it's a feeling state. I accessed a feeling state and you can't really describe such things. Mm. Um, but yeah, that was, it humbled me. It made me really humble and it made me more willing to, you know, tap into inspiration, I guess, in a way that I would have typically been more stubborn. Uh, but until I had that and, and, and Jason talked about it moments ago about this stubbornness that could kick in where you feel like, you know, you want to go into it your way and you have this sense of control and then you trip, you fall, you get back up. And it's like, you learn through the getting back up phase, uh, for me and my code and the way that I've been operating through my code, I've been trying to access those, uh, those realizations, I guess, before the <laughs> tripping phase, but I got to admit, you know, I'm a human. We're all human. We've all, we've all been there. We've all been through that darkness, but what taught me it was me literally just sitting in my uh, apartment playing guitar. And it does come back to this meditative, like uh, Zen mode where, and, and anyone who follows my work, you know, I'm not a promoter of meditation because I believe meditation could be anything. It could be you in your garden. It could be you washing dishes. It could be me playing guitar. It could be Jason reading books and doing his research. It could be Logan doing his decode. Um, so it is just your form, you know, your form of how to access presence and how to walk in your purpose while you're, whilst you're present. And that is everything. That is where I feel like we become, uh, supernatural almost and we start to realize these things like there's something coming to us from this information field from this whatever whatever terminology we want to put it into but it's inspired me a lot to almost surrender to the control of it all and just say that i want this whatever that is to work through me and as i let it work through me i see the results and i see what it what it what it shines out and it's amazing shit. And I'm not saying that to be egoic or pompous or anything. It's it's me saying this, hopefully, to inspire other people to let them know that there's no special quality about me. I just decided to calm myself and fully invest myself into what it is that I'm passionate about. And once you align passion with, uh, you know, with that feeling, that feeling state, it's game over. You know, you become you become something that you might have never believed you could ever become. And there is this indoctrination system in the news and all this other shit trying to like demote you from your essence and 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 your your posture. But just remember that that that's all there to distract you. So I say to myself all the time, like I was born with antivirus software. Like it's impossible for this uh for this parasite to get to me. But I did have I did have this uh thing about me as a creator where I almost thought that I was the one bringing it to the forefront. And and ever since I had that moment where I tapped in to like, whoa, you know, this might not be uh, myself right now, but this might be re me remembering something. It's like wiping away amnesia. <laughs> that was where I became super humble to it all. And my creative uh, output became very unique. I got, I got a comment. I, ha I had to I had to drink another one, Jordan. Oh, what, oh, oh you, what? He's gonna get drunk on camera. <laughs> yeah, bro, get drunk on that waters above, baby. Man, listen, I had to drink another one to that because meditation, you nailed it. Meditation is anything you personally develop for yourself that allows you to tap into source. My meditation is very unique and I recognize this. I do not sit Indian style and try to zone out. Let me tell you something. My when when I have my moments of genius, 
And that's exactly what they are. When whole concepts are basically created for me so I can extrapolate and show other people what I see. <clears throat> when this happens, it's always when I'm reading. And let me explain. I can be reading one of the most boring books in the world, 1923, Lewis Mumford, Techniques and Civilization. I hated that book, but I read the thing. It's like, it's like, it's like 450 pages, but it was micro print. It, it was old, and, and it was basically it was basically all the elements to a perfectly working infrastructure. That's what the book is about. But I read it anyway. I pushed through, and I found some gold nuggets. But as I'm reading that book... Other things that I have I have absorbed in the past, but never put together, were put together for me while I was reading this boring ass book and many other boring ass books. As I'm reading them, I'm deep off because reading sends me into another world. I'm gone. I'm gone. My listen, my loved ones, friends, and family that are around me, they hate it when I'm reading because. I totally ignore the world and nothing bothers me. Even in prison, guys would be fighting right there and they would be fighting hard, but they knew keep the fight over there. Don't, don't bring me out of my, cause I'm going to be, I'm going to join the fight, but I would sit there and be in a day room while all chaos is going on. And I'm so deep in my reading, I'm gone, but I would have my moments of clarity and put things together fast when I came out of it and it wouldn't have anything to do with what I was reading at that moment. It would be all this other stuff that I had acquired and hadn't done anything with. And all of a sudden reading this put everything into perspective, even though this didn't have anything to do with what, what I, my new, my new understanding on, on something I had already previously researched. So meditation is awesome because it puts you at a vibrational state that allows you to tap into this this thought field and to pull all this free data to you and and then you can show the then you can show the proof later you can put the theory together first you know i did this over and over and over and over and then because i put the theory together then all all the data came to me to support it so i agree i had to drink to that I totally agree. Let's Medita let's let's get them to drink to five more things, Jordan. I want to meditation. <laughs> hey, meditation comes in many forms. It's not the same for everybody. Yeah, You're right. Yeah, it's it's a, it, meditation is challenging. I'm I'm more into creative visualization. I think meditation's like, you know, really honing in on a certain. Or you can observe your thoughts, of course. People ask like, how how do you meditate? Just try to meditate is meditation. Um, it is therapeutic, uh, but I think creative visualization really is where you end up leading yourself off to. Because I don't think we're we're designed to not think. Like people say, well, I'm just going to focus on my breath, and I say, well, you you have to think to focus on your breath, so you're thinking. So yeah. I just don't think you can stop thinking. I just think when you start to select what you're thinking about, just like a great analogy is when you go to the airport and you collect your luggage and you're going through and you're watching all the luggage go around the carousel, you're looking at all the luggage, but you're not really paying any attention to it because you're looking for your bag. And when you, when you can take mm. that example into That's meditation, way of putting it. yeah, you, it's like, okay, when I go into this meditation, I'm going to focus on the idea or the objective, which is whatever it is you want to focus upon. And when you start to do that, you're going to see, you'll be infiltrated by a ton of other luggage that has no relevance to what your objective is. So obviously practice is comes in handy. And that's why meditation is not a, a scratch ticket kind of uh, thing, uh, exercise to do. It's a really good thing to do. Um, okay. So we got the, we got the thought forms out. So we have this collective field. And I think Jason, when you talked about reading books, cause I'm, I'm a, I don't really read books as much anymore. I, I, Jordan, I know you don't read books at all, but you read. Um, I'm more into reading a lot online now. Um, but I think a book's, I look at them as like an archetype, like inside the pages of that book contains a thought field uh, of collective ideas. And I think if you look at a book esoterically through the structure of sacred geometry, is that book, does that book have a silver lining to it? Does it connect somewhere into the cloud? You, I, I look at, you know, it's really interesting and I'll leave, well, let's go with this route guys. Um, I'm really looking at this reality as like a computer and, and many people have, right? Many people do the motherboard, the mm -hmm. central processing unit, the hard drive. Um, wh what's your take on that? I mean, Jason, what does AI AIX fit into that equation? If we're living into, because simulation, right? We've done the simulation theory three times. I mean, name it simulation theory four. 
Uh, but but AIX, how does AIX fit into perhaps this reality being a, just a computer? Okay, I'll answer this one very fast <clears throat> from two two different perspectives. One of them is some of the oldest traditions in the world, and the other one is from the Matrix movie movie series. The first one, the oldest traditions in the world, basically tell us the same story, that there was a golden age when nothing went wrong, people got everything they wanted, nobody really learned anything, it was luxurious, people got lazy and slothful, the gods got pissed off, and they initiated a cataclysm. That's that's in a nutshell. I just gave you thousands of years of history in a nutshell. Now, if that's the original scenario, then something else must have been introduced later to cause strife and contention, which leads to maturity and growth, something that the Golden Age people didn't enjoy. So let's move to the Matrix movie. In the Matrix movie, Neo, I don't know if it was the original Matrix, but it's one of the movies in the trilogy. Neo is specifically told by the architect. He is told by the architect of the different different simulations that are the different matrices that are created and the first couple were the same scenario of the golden age when people could do and become anything they wanted to and it was an absolute complete disaster so they introduced the agent smiths into the into the system they introduced the agitators that made things difficult now people had to work for the things that they wanted and still they sometimes wouldn't get it some people would still die in poverty so <clears throat> when they introduced the elements of danger and unhappiness the matrix became real and now everybody believed it this is what neo was told by the architect and so it totally makes sense that something happened to the original construct. Originally, a bunch of immortal souls were run through the system and it didn't work because they got everything they wanted. Yeah. They used they used the simulacrum in the way it was supposed to be used as a co-creator relationship and they helped build all kinds of worlds and systems and they probably did, there's probably a thousand different golden ages and they were all badass, but in the end, not one of those, not one of those immortal beings, which was us, ever matured or really developed or grew because we didn't know any real danger. We didn't really experience anything. So it, a new system had to be implemented where these immortal souls were actu ab actually convinced inside the constraints of the construct that death was real, that there was real consequences now. Things were to be feared and that and the only way that this could have been done was by entering a, a new program. I call it artificial intelligence X, a new program that would be the new agitator. And it would it would actually try to corral all these immortals into niches polarized so it can not only not only empower itself because it suffers from the law of diminishing returns it also suffers from the law of entropy and it also suffers from the law of uh, conservation of energy so it needs a power source but the collective is plenty of power for it to do it's a feedback loop yep. but the errants are those who are actually doing what the oversoul wanted from the beginning now they're the ones recognizing that this is a relationship between them and the Oversoul. They can be co-creators and that they're going to have to go through the darkness in order to inherit their light. That's that's in a nutshell. Well said. Jordan, what do you got on that, brother? I, th I think the way that, um, and this could be building off of Jason's theory, I look at it like time is the most important element to all of this and i think that if we were to consider what a golden age would be it would probably be an age without death it would be an immortality age and whether we look at that uh you know actually physically it's up to debate but i i would venture to say it could be physical that we just live forever in that golden age and that is what actually leads to the complacency and the 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 stagnation if you will so this is why saturn is worshiped because he is the grim reaper. He is father time. So when you add in that element of time, that's when you give this so-called agitator to the realm. So I look at what Jason's talking about and, and what the architect is probably um, putting in as a variable here would just be mortality. It's giving you a timeline of life. And, and this is my philosophical, you know, like uh, run around of what this could possibly be. I think that in the prior iterations of this matrix and the origin, you had no death. 
And that's what led to the stagnation. That's what led to you being uh, lazy and lackadaisical, et cetera. And then adding in the element of just you having a death was all it took for you to get your shit together. So now the Grim Reaper walks with you whilst you're here in this fourth dimension, right? And this is not a bad guy. It's not that death is a bad guy. It's actually the best part of this life is the fact that it has an end. Because if I gave you right now the opportunity to live forever, but then you just kept going and going and going, you would eventually probably hit a point of critical mass where you're like, just end it already. Just yeah. fucking rip the cord out, you know? So people think they want immortality, but in actuality, if you had to live through it, especially physiologically, there would be this sense of boredom. There'd be this sense of why, why even accomplish anything? If I'm never going to die, then that means death isn't a fear. Now, if you look at this from both sides, this is fascinating because one of the elements that we have and that pe a lot of people who follow our works is that we're not afraid of death anymore. So it's like we have to be faced with this idea called death, this concept called death, but we no longer fear it. So this is what makes this AIX or what I'm calling Saturn or the Grim Reaper. This is what makes him become your homie. He's your friend now. This thing has no reason to fuck with you because it's like, oh, you don't fear me. So now I'm like a court jester. I'm here to make your life fun. You know, you look at reality now like it's a circus or a zoo or a zoo. So I'm here to just ha hold your hand and we're going to we're going to hang out together now. So when you stop fearing this mortality is when you really ascend. That's your ascension. And ultimately we we would want death. Like I know people say that they they wouldn't, but so anyways, my last thing to say is that I just do feel like the transition out of the first iterations of the matrix to the current would have just been that one variable is Let's go from, you know, we think what would make this the best would be giving them infinite life. And clearly that doesn't work. So let's give them death and see what, what happens. And it's clear as day to me that the New World Order flaunts this, you know, through skull and bones and all their other symbol symbolism. They show you that once you can be playful with this concept of death, well, then you've you've transcended the so-called soul trap or the idea that you're trapped here. It's just by being fearless of life is what allows you to live. Mm. I, I, you know, those are great. You, both of you guys had some amazing expressions on, on that whole topic. Um, personally, I mean, I look at people, I really, I observe the human being species. I think people really, you know, fear is the dominant, in my opinion, fear is the dominant emotion on the world stage currently right now, because as both of you mentioned, love, you get lazy. Um, you know, like if you just use the example of getting into a relationship, when you first start dating somebody, you'll change outfits five times, you'll take forever to get ready, you'll look your best. Um, you know, it's exciting, it's the honeymoon stage. And over time, that doesn't take place anymore, you will start to abolish those practices that you once did for the majority of people. And then you know, give it a few years, you move in together. You know, you're not concerned about the way you look in the morning when you wake up, you don't care if you have bad breath. You definitely wouldn't go on a date having bad breath when you're just starting out dating somebody. You'll make sure that you avoid those because it's about looking good. So once you start to get rid of that and you become more comfortable, as both of you mentioned, you become very lazy. And uh, when you say, I love you to your partner, it doesn't have the same meaning as when you first said it. When you very, all of you that are in relationships, when you first say, I love you for the very first time, is it the same? Does it have the same value and meaning two, three years down the line when you're walking out the door and you say, I love you, see you later? Probably not. And this is the whole concept of the agitator. Um, and what propels us to create if you've moved past the complainer aspect? Well, fear, right? Not, not having enough. How am I going to pay my bills? got to go out there and earn the bucks to create some energy to, to, to buy your items and to pay your way through life. And this whole love and fear thing, I think really those are the two emotions. Personally, I think that's what feeds this, this battery, which I think earth is, I think earth is a battery, um, you know, in your body you have these cells and they give off energy as they create death and regeneration through apoptosis. That's what the cells do. <clears throat> a lot of them are self suicide. And the cells, when they die, they create energy, which is called ATP. And that's, I think, that's a fractal down. I think that's what human beings do on this uh, playing field is 
when we live, we create energy. When we die, we give off energy and it's a never ending cycle. Um, and I think that's what life is, but I think Jason brought up the, the, the point, the good point here, you know, the golden age, people get lazy. Then you create the agitator, essentially the boogeyman, the devil out to get you, which is time, which is the, which is the basis of Kronos and these concepts through astrology and Saturn and all that. And Jordan, you brought up the great point of Saturn. You, you make it your best friend. I read somewhere once where someone said, and this was discussing Yaldabaoth, right? Which I think is Allah. Um, but and it could be the moon, but once you make it your friend, it leaves you alone. Meaning, and, and I really took to heart on that. I want to get your guys' opinion on that. Like, Jordan, I know you touched on this already, but once you stop complaining and blaming, do you think that's kind of a requisite to finally level up and check that off the bo box and you get perhaps what's called the DNA upgrade and you become much more of a, you know, uh, an errant, as you say, Jason, what, what's your take on that? when you stop blaming and you just kind of make it your friend rather than your enemy. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm, I've talked about this a few times on my channel. It's, uh, it's once you regard reality itself, because most people that they, they, they don't, they don't buy into the concept that a very few atheists really exist. They don't buy into the concept that this world is not a construct of something. They just package it in their own unique ways based off culture and experience and opinion. But, once you regard reality as personable and that it is your friend, it becomes your friend. Uh, it's just to say it's a, the, the, op the opposite is true. In any endeavor in your life, if you think opposition exists, then reality will reciprocate to make sure that you're not being a liar and that it will knit for you opposition to whatever you're trying to accomplish. It's going to make it's going to let you write your own code. So the best way to move forward in life and whatever you want to do is to start regarding reality not as a, not as an agitator, not as something that is working against you, which is very easy to do and which is most people do. The best way is to wake up in the morning, be thankful for what you have and thankful for what you're about to receive and regard reality as a friend. And once reality, well, once this is done, projected enough, I don't know what enough is. It all depends on your own personal dynamics. But once this is a done, it becomes a feedback loop. Then reality begins to make make situations and circumstances and bring you into contact with favorable things that all of a sudden it's like, damn, man, everything's going my way. With very little effort, I'm getting all the things that I need and I want. And it's like life is a chess game. And now all of a sudden I'm making all the right moves. And because you're elated about what's going on, the feedback loop is reinforced. You're more thankful. You're even more convinced that reality is your friend. Reality recipro reciprocates by reflecting even more circumstances into your reality tunnel to reflect that state of awareness. That relationship depends on you. You have to initiate that. But once you do, the feedback loop is created. And then it's empowered the more you're grateful for the relationship. Yeah, well, well, so I love those analogies, man. My mind was just going off. Jordan, Jordan, what's your take on that? Yeah, no, that's really my mode. Like my mode is to go about every day burning as least amount of calories as possible. So I just store and utilize my calories for my creations and anything that starts to agitate me or get under my skin or bother me, I realize those things are my greatest teachers. All the things that offend me, all the things that bother me, all the things that I think are my so-called enemy are actually there to teach me. And I've accepted such a thing. And now I see the opportunity and all the stuff that I used to project outwardly as, as a fear. So all of the circumstances that seem like problems or mistakes or mishaps or traumas or whatever labeling system you want to use for those, those are my greatest choices. Those are my greatest, uh, you know, opportunities to mine consciousness from those events. So I, I definitely agree, man. Like I wake up every day in my life and I try to walk in grace. And I think that's what um, Jason was talking about before. Like there's this element of gratitude. There's this element of like seeing that there's something good, even though if you want to have a feeling of negativity because it feels bad or it feels like it's not going your way or this or that, that's actually an opportunity for you to just accept it as part of this 
experience and and if you could look at it in the eye and know that it can't harm you if no weapon could be formed against you as they say then it's just a tool for you to utilize so it's up to you to make that choice so of course the uh the fear programming this indoctrination is keeping you in this level where you feel like everything outside of you is much bigger and much more powerful than you are but in actuality you in the present moment are the only powerful thing uh, I was actually making a little bit of a joke about this earlier. I was on a group coaching call with some of my clients and I was talking about how I was in my kitchen or I was sitting in the in the living room looking at my kitchen and I saw the frying pan there. And I'm like, well, when we talk about purpose and the purpose of life and what is the purpose of this or what is the purpose of that? It's like that frying pan over there has no purpose without me. It's like that frying pan only exists for <laughs> me to use it. Yeah. And it sounds ridiculous. It sounds absolutely stupid, but in actuality, it's like it it is only, yeah. And and I've started to look at my reality like this on a daily basis. I'm like, everything here is an instrument for my success. And now I'm speaking from the metaphysical side of it. I'm speaking from the abundant mindset side of it. Every single problem, harmful thing, you know, mishap, it's perfect. And and my overall philosophy that I've been uh coming to lately is that there is no evil. There is no negativity. There is no problem. There is no uh, issues. Like it is all perfect. It's all happening perfectly. Everything that you think is evil or formed against you or negative, it will become that. So if you want to walk around like that's your reality, then that's the reality you will be saturated in. Mm -hmm. And I've made a conscious decision that I, I'm not going to go on that pathway because every time I exercise what I just said, how to be grateful, even if it seems problematic or be grateful, if it seems like it's negative, I get in, I get immense rewards. It seems like it's the easiest way to live. Like things just show up for me. Things are just happening for me. So there's this effortlessness to flow state and you could only access flow state by being like being a flow, being in flow. And every time you have judgment or you have this resentment built up or you feel like this thing is your enemy or it's a problem or an agent or whatever, like I'll sign off on this. You remember the Matrix movie in the third movie, the moment where Neo uh, defeats Agent Smith is the moment he stops fighting him. Yeah. He just says it's inevitable. He looks at Agent Smith and he says it's inevitable and he stops fighting him and Agent Smith can't believe it and he fucking explodes. So you need to stop fighting your shadow self. Like your shadow self is there to actually promote your well-being. It's there to teach you lessons. You've just been going your whole life thinking that these problems are bad or that this evil thing is negative, but it's always an opportunity for you to mind consciousness from it and for be to be grateful and forgive. So there's, there's no more uh, profound technology that exists beyond belief than forgiveness and gratitude. Gratitude's where it's at, man. I say that's kind of the ultimate. Because I think it's higher than love and fear. I think gratitude is really the ultimate feeling or experience people should get into. Um, great, 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 great content, both of you on that. I, 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 the agitation was a big thing because Jordan and I, you and I have talked about this. I think Jason, you, you and I have even talked about it on our simulation theories. Is that, ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to go around and you're going to focus on the dirty laundry, the news, which is seemingly is the agitation that we've been talking about, you'll become part of the agitation. You'll join the agitation family. And when you do that, you enforce the agitation, which has a job to do. The dirty laundry, the news, all the things you think that are evil and bad. It has it's an art, these are archetypes. They have jobs to do. But if you want to go work for that team, because you live, you talk about it with your neighbors and your friends and you blame and it's them and it's they and it's their fault. You become part of the agitation and then your life becomes agitated. And then you get on, you know, uh, anxiety and depression and stress and your life no longer becomes blissful. And then you become a complainer instead of a creator. So I think one of the requisites, I think all three of us here can agree upon. Jason, you might want to do another shot with this one here. Um, uh, is yeah. that, you know, if you want to really become that errant, as you say, if you want to become that individualistic and level up and have a DNA upgrade, it's getting rid of the, the agitation in your life, which means you've got to disassociate yourself from these constructs that are in this mainframe for a reason. Uh, it serves a purpose, but again, you got to choose that through, you know, what, what we call free will and be that, I like to call it, be that anomaly. 
an errant anomaly, et cetera, et cetera, whatever you want to call it. So anyways, any, anything else you guys want to talk about that we've been going for a while? I don't, I, I know some of you can say, oh, that's it. You guys should keep talking. But I know Jordan, you're on a tight <laughs> schedule and I'm not sure what Jason's time frame is. Yeah, I want to, I want to call to your attention since we mentioned the matrix, we need, I think we owe a little credit to mentioning the origin of the entire concept for the matrix movies. They stemmed from from uh, from books that were written by Philip K. Dick, and this is a man that that everybody needs to know about. I'm I'm thinking about doing a video or two introducing my my, my anybody who doesn't know about him. Uh, I don't know. I haven't even started the video. It's just something I was thinking about because. Philip K. Dick in the 1970s had an experience and then wrote a book that basically exploded forth and even baffled the scientific establishment because how intricately he describes our reality as being almost like a computerized matrix. And this was before computers were even in the, the nomenclature. This was before computers really even existed for the average human. The only computers around were like the Cray computers of, uh, uh, you know, government high-rise buildings and stuff. Philip K. Dick then went on to write movies that you've seen, like The Adjustment Bureau yep. and different movies. Every movie is the same. He, he Minority wrote, Report. Yeah, Minority Report. I think Time Copper. It's all those movies that yeah. involve the future when the future is admittedly almost like a hologram or a matrix, and it can be it can be manipulated. And yeah, it's a uh, Philip K. Dick deserves recognition, and I, I think that the the writers of the Matrix movie did a real disservice by not giving him acknowledgement for being the, one of the main influencers of, of that trilogy. I don't, I don't, I don't even know if well, I, from what I, I've, I've watched, I've heard, I think there's a guy named Tom, Tom something, Tom Outhouse, who claims he was the original screenplay writer of the matrix. Oh, well, he might've been the original screenplay writer. I, I wouldn't doubt that. But what I'm saying is, is there's many scenes in the matrix uh -huh. movie, like, like that involve like the actress that played Trinity. Yep. There are many scenes that are almost copied straight out of uh, Philip K. Dick's writings, but he was never given credit for that. Yeah. No, he was great. He, he, I mean, he's the cyberpunk, which, which yeah. then we can get into, I guess maybe end off this transmission by asking both of you guys what you think are, are, are the cyberpunk and Philip K. Dick and what he's talking minority report. I had mentioned this before in some of my podcasts, I feel like that's where we're going. And what was minority report all about? It was preventing crimes. It was the crime prevention unit. How do you do that? How do you prevent crimes from happening? Because you have all the data in place. Everything like imagine, imagine, I think that's all what we're doing at this point as decoders, we're, we're all, you're taking astrology, you're combining it with the numerology, which is combining it with the human design, personality types, the tarot, the cards of illumination, sine and cosine waves, mathematics, prime numbers, you know, square pi, whatever. We're taking all these and we're condensing them down. And is this what's shaping our future to come? And Minority Report is basing on preventing crimes because you're now having the computer accessibility to look and see about what's going to happen in our future. Is that what's coming down the pike? Is that what, is he, what he was talking about? I, I say yes. And is this the case? Do you guys think that we're moving into this uh, age of transhumanism? And what does that look like? I think, I think in Minority Report, Philip K. Dick was conveying that the only way to influence or or to ascertain the trajectory of events was to use other humans as an interface between those who are inside the construct yep. and those who are jacked into it more. Remember, yep. they couldn't do anything without those, those girls three. Being, those, gir those girls being oh, three people, yeah. It's like cerebral interface holography. Yep. So Philip, Philip K. Dick's model, it required those on the inside to use others that were on the inside as a bridge yep. to understand like a catalyst, that, right? The architecture itself. Yep. 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 What, what's your take on it, Jordan? What, what do you what do you see coming moving forward here? I mean, a lot of revelations coming on the pike. Well, you and I have discussed this, but what do you think on that? The cyberpunk and the future. Yeah, no, this is amazing. And I think we should definitely uh, touch on this because it was based off of the whole 
theme behind why we all got together, which is talking about the end of this year and, uh, you know, right. Jason's predictions and everything we talked about. But I, I just released moments before we got together a decode called World Reserve Decoded. And it talks all about the month of June, July, August. And uh, I, I've already revealed what I feel about October, but I haven't gone into great detail with a decode. I just had the conversation with me and Jason in our last uh, podcast we did together. So now that Elon Musk is a huge part of all of this, um, it's making me feel like he's a, he's a huge component to the Western world moving into something similar to like what China does. But I don't think that the United States is quite just ready for it yet. I don't think that, you know, it's all going to happen as fast as uh, some people might assume. I think it's going to take some time. But needless to say, just as of earlier today, uh, Twitter has been um, transformed into X Corp. And has this it? change no, no. of okay. Twitter, yes. Uh, and this change right here is part of his uh, plan to create something called an everything app. And it is very similar to China's WeChat. And if you know how WeChat works, yep. you get an idea. Now, just months ago, we saw on the world stage the introduction exoterically, like everyone knows about it, common uh, by now, the chat GPT and open AI. And I know me and Jason talked about it a little bit in our last transmission as well. So there's a lot being uh, rolled out, like a lot of infrastructure being laid out. And, and I could see that this change, this transformation for uh, Twitter could be a big component into moving into the so-called transhumanism, moving into a cashless society. And they've been leveraging on this puppet, Elon, uh, for a lot of things, a lot of agendas to be pushed. You know, so when it comes to the self-driving cars and the neural link and uh, mobile payments, mobile payment apps and making all this shit like look cool and look fun and look positive, you know, he's he's kind of the talking head behind all of that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about it. And I, I heard a small clip from Christine Lagarde, who's in charge of the Euro Central Bank. And she straight up said recently that they will be making a decision on the central bank digital currency for Europe by October of this year. So that adds an even more confirmation behind the last conversation that I had with Jason that we are moving cashless in the in the first world, you know, and I, I don't see America being so quick to accept this, but in Europe, for sure. Europe could be, um, we don't know what they can go through. And I don't think it's going to be all for one right away. I think there'll be some pushback. There's already some pushback. But when you take convenience and then you add in uh, social pressure and you add in all these other layers to how society works, um, it's just part of that totalitarian tiptoe. So I'm open-minded into how this is all going to go, but it still seems like October is the time for an event. And the only way for them to really push forth with an agenda is to have crisis. So I talked about this on the deco that I just released about Yuri Bezmenov's four stages of uh, ideological subversion. And he talks about how, you know, stage one has pretty much been complete in the Western world. It's called demoralization. We're well aware of this. Uh, step two is destabilization, which I believe we're currently in the process of. And then step three is called crisis. And this could happen in a single day. And uh, the final step is normalization. So I do feel that there is different stages for different practices. For one, we could have normalization when it comes to utilization of uh, tablets and devices and computers. We know this. Like the world has gotten very used to using phones to communicate. We all have a pocket computer now. Whilst 20 years ago, we didn't have a pocket computer. Hmm. Um, obviously, not the entire world has this. Not the entire world has it. Uh, there's the developing world, of course, which is a large por por uh, portion of the population. But, you know, just hearing Yuri Bezmenov talk about this four-step process probably like 30 years ago where he, ex he exposed how the first phase could take 10 to 15 years and the second phase could take six months and the, the third phase of crisis can happen in a single event. People might think that 9-11 uh, was crisis or the C-19 event was crisis. No way. I think more what Jason talks about in his last, um, you know, in the last conversation we had of some sort of internet blackout or some rebooting of the internet, that would be more crisis level shit. 
So maybe I'll hand this back over to Jason um, to hear his thoughts on, you know, I, I think for the listeners who have no idea about what happens in October based in Jason's theories, uh, it might be good for him to share some of uh, just the brief summary of what he sees. Okay. Uh, two videos. Two videos of mine. The first one, I was just going into detail about the Phi and Pi relationships, the Phoenix programming relationships that I found at different historical events where, like in 1941, uh, 1859, false, the, the Carrington event, uh, major blackouts, uh, then 1971, 73, I found these mathematical relationships that were all connected to uh, September of 2023. And I show this in the video and I explain, I said, look, this doesn't, this, this right here is pretty compelling because if something is going to be true, it can always be seen from multiple different mathematical uh, uh, perspectives. So in one video, I'm explaining, look at all, all the, all these relationships here, all these historical events are, they're mathematically connected to an event in September of 2023. So, uh, and they're all related to the collapse of a computer uh, infrastructure. Uh, some some of the some of the connecting events was the very first time a computer was 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 a. Uh, uh, made operational the very first time computer program was, was patented uh, all these things all these firsts are connected but also equally connected are all these major blackout events and the uh even the day the internet transformed from the arpanet to the commercialized internet for the public it's connected so i am i use that video to basically predict this is look every bit of this is connected to the carrington event and other solar solar uh, minimum and solar maximum activity in the past, I says, I have no other conclusion but to give you guys my interpretation based off each one of these mathematical deals. So to me, a combination of all these associations and relationships would be basically what's going to happen September 2023. So I put that video out and I basically said, look, we're looking for some type of internet takedown that, that has something to do with the world's finances. This is what we're looking at. And I believe it's going to be temporary, but I believe when they bring the system back up, it's going to be fundamentally different. Now, this is my whole prediction. So a little time passed and square peg divergent went even deeper. And she found a lot more stuff to comport with that. But at the same time, somebody sent me a list of 22 Hollywood productions <laughs> and in, and I did a whole video showing all these movies. I listed them out and showed that since the year 2007, 2008, there's been at least 22 major blockbuster movies where something terrible happened in September of 2023. These are movies about the future. So I couldn't believe there was that many references. It blew my mind. I had to do a video on it. So this is the sum total of my data. Square Pig on her own channel, she has her own data that's very compelling because she does a lot of arithmetic, mathematical, calendrical uh, uh, studies as well. She has a whole video about, about the false Carrington event, because that's what it's going to be. We're not predicting a real EMP. We're not predicting a real uh, solar flare. We are predicting a staged event. It can be anything. They've got all kinds of things in their day. They still got alien invasion on the table. They still got uh, Russia's going to nuke a bunch of co uh, countries on the table. They have different dominoes they can play, but the effect is all I'm I'm concerned with. And the effect to me is that in September or possibly like you say October, there's going to be a major fundamental change to the internet or to the electronic banking systems in the world. It's going to be one. It's going to be one of those two or both of them in tandem. It's going to be a temporary interruption, but what comes back is going to be fundamentally different. Well, I tell you guys what, man, uh, astrologically, I'm looking at the map, um, you know, and Jordan and I have shared this already before in our financial collapse podcast. But I mean, to reiterate this point that you both are talking about, you know, why do these things happen in the fall time in the Tropic of Cancer, Cancer being ruled by the moon? So there is the moon involved with this here, but because it's in the sign of Libra, now I'm using sidereal astrology, which is the true match to astronomy and the sky, not Western. It is going to be sidereal. In sidereal astrology, in the month of October, the sun, which represents the spirit in the sky, is going to be in the sign of Libra. 
Okay. And joining forces conjunct, meaning right next to one another, you have Mercury, the messenger, you have Mars, the god of war, and you have the axis of the dragon head, K2 and Rahu, which are probably one of the biggest aspects to look at in astrology itself. And this is moving through Libra and the sign of Aries, the ram. And across the way in Aries, the ram forming a symbiotic relationship, you have the mighty Jupiter there with the father of technology, which is Uranus. So these are all lining up with what Jordan has talked about, which is what Jason's talking about and what Jordan and I have talked about in the financial collapse astrologically. And you obviously have Saturn in the sign of Aquarius and Pluto, the wrecking ball, which will be there till 2039 in the sign of Capricorn. So to me, these are all layers that are speaking loudly of something happening and whether it's real fake staged or not, it, it, these are all lining up that way to happen. And I think it could be really a combustion going on um, in the fall, as we've talked about. And I think they're going to be micro bursts from now until the fall time personally, that could potentially happen. I think one of them could come in the month of May, but again, this is pure speculation and theoretical, but yeah, I think, Oh, uh, Oh, uh... The Elon Musk, I, I just want to go back to what Jordan was talking about for a second. Elon Musk, to me, is a confidence man. He's a confidence man for the uh, elite. And for those who don't understand this terminology, in the grifter game, grifters are scammers. They're high They're high elite scammers. They pull off major scam, financial scams. And they're, they work in teams and stuff. But let me tell you something. Elon Musk, to me, my opinion is that he's the ultimate confidence man. The confidence man is put out there by hid, hidden others who finance him, who market him, and who empower him. And he's put out there to gain the confidence of the collective to the main body of people. He's the hero. He's the ultimate truther. He's the one that released the Twitter files. He's the one that he's not going to just accept everything NASA says. So he created Space Force. He's the one that's that's uh, pushing for electric cars. He's going to save the planet. He has all these ideals. Listen. This man is being groomed for a, there's no, there's no reason for a confidence man. Confidence men are not needed unless in long-term planning, somebody is intending to use him to pull off a major deception. Well, I tell you, I tell you what, if you're a fan of tarot, man, look at your screen. Here's, this is, uh, this right here is Elon Musk's birth card. Now, even if you're not a fan of the tarot, I'll tell you the two of wands, you can clearly see the person standing in between the two pillars. Those represent the sun and the moon. And this person's holding the world in the palm of their hands. This card right here in the tarot, ladies and gentlemen, is the card of the futurist. This is Elon Musk's birth card. Okay. His birth card is this card right here. It's the card of the futurist, the two meaning duality. The two of wands, meaning the two of clubs, which is all about air and the sun and ideas from the from from the collective. Uh, so, I mean, is this guy being groomed? Well, I mean, certainly is a very very good position to put out there. Um, and the world the the world thrives on following people, <laughs> you know. And this guy putting satellites out there. You got the we got the Neuralink. Uh, you know, he's we're being formed in Fremont, California. I, I'm, I'm working on a decode about, about the Neuralink, but is this what's coming down the pike? And I mean, are people going to, are people going to jump into this with what he's pushing on the world stage? Time will tell, man, it's going to be interesting coming down the pike here. So Cer certainly a subject for another video. Yeah. Yeah, man. We could definitely, I did a short decode on him, but, um, I mean, you know, this postulates a perspective of are people being cloned uh, and groomed from a laboratory from the very beginning, and then they are their whole their whole past is fabricated to make it look real, but they're 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 literally they're cloned. They're cloned. They're they're grown artificially. Listen, and a lot of people, to a lot of people will think I'm absolutely insane, yep. and I don't care. But I'm convinced there's been at least three upgrades to Joe Biden, and they keep fucking it up. He's dumber and dumber each time they bring him in. But 
but the Joe Biden we have right now doesn't look like the Joe Bidens mm -hmm. in past in past pictures and photographs. And I think they keep bringing this, this bumbling idiot in, and they can't they can't change that programming. They've tried before. We're on the third or fourth Joe Biden right now. Yeah, I, well, I mean, Yo, he's, Jason, he's you know right? that you know that term airhead, right? Yeah. Well, this comes back to the age of Aquarius. It's like they've they've selected the prime time airheads to represent the leadership, the so called leadership of these power player roles on the world stage. Wow. And they've been doing this now since pretty much George Bush Jr. That's been their essence. This is why, like when we had Trump in position, you can see the similarities between prime minister of you know, certain nations. Like, I mean, it was across the board. You have this similar essence and vibe. And I, I kind of look at this now as a huge push into the globalist agenda. And I've talked about this a little bit in my work, how they want you to feel like the current structure that we call government is, is failed. It's corrupt. It doesn't work. And this is the perfect environment for them to usher in a globalist agenda, something like the United Nations being your global court system, your global uh, governing body. This is ultimately what their plan is. So um, it's pretty fascinating to see where these other player characters fit into all of it, such as an Elon Musk. And I, I agree with what you said. You, you summarized it really well as a confidence man. And there are these other player characters across other uh, parts of this world stage that are doing a similar duty. And um, we are very, very close, I think, to having an event happen. It's it's amazing how you talked about the Phoenix phenomenon being from May to May, because naturally throughout all my work, I've been telling people that I feel that there will be transformation between May of 2023 and May of 2024. And this comes back to um, a prediction that I have about the next eclipse in April 8th, this being the great American eclipse forming the X over the United States of America. Um, thinking about Elon now converting Twitter into X Corp, and we have this great American eclipse from October 14th, 2023 to April 8th, 2024. And then if you think of it, uh, the April 15th ritual date, how it lands on a Monday this year, and I've talked a lot in my work, how if April 15th lands on a Monday, you're almost guaranteed to have a, a ritual that everyone in the world knows about. So if you look at the sinking of the Titanic, Boston Marathon bombing, Notre Dame fire, day in the during the pandemic where we had the most cases, I mean, it's all on that April 15th day. Uh, in 2021, Bernie Madoff died on April 14th. He was tied to the 2008 collapse with Lehman Brothers and all of that shit. So something is about this September that is very repeatable it's it's cyclical and if we were to go back perhaps to um prior prior iterations of september i think it would be clear as day that this is a time frame where you get some of your biggest market collapses and and change an in infrastructure of economics and once you start to change that infrastructure you change the way we live life oh you know what um, and i believe go ahead oh no i was just gonna say i believe this year we'll have that 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 event uh in september october and it's all tied to this um to this energy that pretty much kicked off in March 10th with Silicon Valley Bank failing. And I don't know if we were uh, talking about that in our last podcast or did we do a podcast before that? But it doesn't really matter. I mean, I just think the dominoes are going to fall in sequence. And Logan said something really poetically about how there'll be like surges of of this energy leading us there. I don't know the exact word he used, but March 10th was one of the first kind of like... Uh, bursts and then may i believe there'll be a burst and then july i believe there'll be a burst and then september october will be like the uh finality of this of the fireworks show if you will right right it's a i sorry about the interruption you just triggered my mind it's when you were talking about the date listen i did i forgot in those two videos that i put out on september 23rd it wasn't just the calendrics in the first video and then the full list of all the Hollywood productions uh, that that mentioned the specifically September 23rd and being disastrous. But uh, I forgot you just triggered my memory. I also have a very long list because I, I spent a whole evening basically Googling every event around the world that has happened in the past 300 years on September 23rd. I could not believe what I found. Really? So I, not I date? Posted, 
I posted that list too in my video as well. Huh. So yeah, you just you just reminded me. I forgot I had done that too. So that's interesting. Yeah, that's so, an amazing so that's an amazing date. What I'm what yeah, I'm basically the... explaining to you is that my two videos cover three data sets. One is the Calendrix 5 Pi Phoenix Programming da uh, uh, Mathematics, all connected to the Carrington event, all kinds of events to September 23rd. That's one data set. Second data set are the 22 Hollywood productions about September 23rd. And then the third data set is actual events in history that are relative to collapses, technology, and uh, uh, disasters that all happened on September 23rd. Three different data sets. That's why I concluded September 23rd is probably probably going to be our our staged event that moves that moves us closer to whatever this this we're going. If we're, if it's going to be a total worldwide collapse back into separatism, nationalism, and, and the globalist, uh, maybe it's a staged globalist fall. The United Nations collapses, Euro colla collapses. All the nations are now independent uh, with each other, which is going to start a war in October. I don't know. It could be just the opposite. It could be the actual globalization of an entire new economic system. I don't know. I just all I'm predicting is is that's the date that the change is going to be initiated, September 23rd. Uh well, I mean, this is the, the, and even if you're, uh, let me narrate this, the Ace of Wands, this is the card for September 23rd. This card right here is Abracadabra. You see that wand it's holding? That's the Hollywood wand. This is the card uh, attached to September 23rd. This is the card of Hollywood. So when Hollywood makes staged. its movies, I said it was staged. This is it. Yeah, this is this is the Hollywood Abracadabra. <laughs> this is the card that's associated with creating something out of thin air. And, and this is the magic wand right here tied to abracadabra so that's september 23rd 23 is the royal star of the lion in numerology which is wow. tied to yaldabaoth which is tied to the moon there you go it's all staged it's tied to the moon man so there's a lot of a lot of merit to what you're saying so let's kind of end this year on uh, getting your thoughts on okay so i have this phoenix let's talk about the phoenix two and i'm going to be highlighting once again the astrological map like i did in the first one but i'm i moved it now to um like i think i have it like 2041 right around because you know pluto is in the sign of capricorn till 2039 and then it moves into the sign of aquarius and so now if we're moving into aquarius which i think potentially could be um 2024 i think perhaps per i have an, a decode coming out of that as well Aquarius decoded the age of Aquarius. Could it be that because if you synchronize all these astrological charts, Chinese with the sidereal with numbers and stuff, you're going to see that on a certain day, March, which is Pi Day of all days, March 14th, you're going to have the sun at one degrees in Aquarius. And Aquarius is, of course, the sign of the dog. And across the way is the sign of the dragon, which is tied to the sun. Um, so the dragon is, we're moved, 2024 is the year of the dragon. So the dragon's going to be opposite of the dog, which is Aquarius. The sun's going to be there on March 14th, 2024. And Pluto moves into the sign of Aquarius. And this could be, ladies and gentlemen, a very, very big deal for the age of Aquarius. But going to 2041, 2040, which Jason, you've talked about your Phoenix event, um, Pluto moves into the sign of Aquarius at that point. I, I took that. I, back. I messed I, up on my 2024. I don't know off the top of my head, but what quadrant is Aquarius in? Well, it's the 11th house, technically. So if it's in the 11th house, it's a, uh, cause you got, you got four, you got the four quadrants, the lion, the bull. Yeah. That's, that's one of it. It's the four fixed signs. That's Matthew, yeah, Mark, lion, Luke, and John. The bull, it's lion, the bull, the eagle, and something else. Yeah, the, the ox, lion, eagle, man. So Aquarius represents the man, which represents the dog in Chinese. And in the gospels, it's the, it's the gospel of Matthew. And okay. Matthew's the tax collector. So you, it's time to pay up. It's time to pay the price. Time to pay up, baby. I mean, that's your taxes are going to be collected. So there's going to be a lot of movement. I mean, I don't know, man. Is there going to be a clearing of the board? Maybe. You know, I mean, when's this going to happen? Well, astrologically, I mean, 241 is the 53rd prime number. 53 is just, it's iodine. It's I am that I am. I mean, well, I this mean, could be the, the clearing of the board in 2041. I, I published uh, in a book, I published Mario reading French scholar, his translations of Nostradamus's quatrains concerning the date index that he discovered. 
and that date index has been verified. It's very, very unique how Nostradamus actually dated his prophecies. It's a very recent discovery. There's a whole book published about it. And what he says about the year 2040 Anno Domini is awesome. It's all Phoenix related. It's all the sun going dark as black, the moon turning red, rocks falling from the sky, the city, the new city of <clears throat> apples being drowned out in the new empire, which would have been the Americas at that time of Nostradamus. So um, it's, it's really interesting. But, but for the year 2041 all the way to 2045, Nostradamus paints a very, very, uh, specific picture that the new empire across the Atlantic is going to be emptying out as migrations are going over Europe back toward the Mediterranean before huh. 2046. It's like all these people in the West are now going back to lands, uh, trying to get closer and closer to the Great Pyramid region and during That's that window between the two cataclysms. That's interesting because Jordan, you can chime in on this. We talked about this. I, I had found that if you overlay a map of the United States and Egypt, you'll see that the Mississippi River running through St. Louis is actually uh, Memphis and Luxor and those areas, and that uh, Cairo, Egypt, and all this, these are all just St. Louis, and that's why you have the arch there. And then Jordan said, well, yeah, but I've been saying that America is the new Garden of Eden. Is that going to end? Is the United States reign going to end? And then this migration that Nostradamus and what you're well, saying uh, here. Lord Bacon wrote a book called New Atlantis, and this is what it's about. I mean, uh, United America was the New Atlantis. But the whole theme to Atlantis was it would become great, rule the whole world, be unmatched, but it would be it would fall to corruption. And then in the last days of it, corruption, it would sink into the sea. But many people, many people migrated by ship and fleet and they got away. The Atlanteans did not end. They became somebody else. But Atlantis was destroyed. So it looks like North America is going is going to ha have a mass migration to Europe and the Mediterranean in the in the time between 2040 and 2046. Interesting timelines to consider, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Jordan, what do you got on that, brother? I mean, this is where I, Jordan, your your work meshed up with mine. I have yet to release that. I have released it, but I, but I mean, the new the new United States, the new the new Garden of Eden, and all that stuff. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, and there's so many things that you both just went through. Wow, amazing. This is probably one of the best podcasts ever <laughs> like when it comes to the amount of value that we jam packed into only a couple hours but yeah i mean i've been looking at america as the garden of eden since the last cataclysm and i believe it will maintain its position and posture as the uh you know leader until the next cataclysm or you know apocalyptic event so it's just it is what it is and as I've studied the past, I see that it just moves position accordingly. And one thing to bring up to both of you is I was really, really intrigued by um, Turkmenistan and a city called Ashgabat. And I believe I spoke with you about it, Logan, uh, yep. several times. But when I investigated further into the city, it's clear as day that this is a part of the world that is being uh, designed or put into let's just say it's being built for a noble or royal. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't even really know how to say it because it's such a, a wild concept, but it's showing me how there is a preparation phase for where the elite will go after they're underground. So I believe they do go below ground it for a, a phase of time. And then when they resurface, they have a, a, a place they occupy. And perhaps it's part of their preparation phase to lay out some of that infrastructure before this moment happens. And it's because they can calculate where the cataclysm is going to hit, how it will affect certain parts of the realm, etc. And when I look at this place in Turkmenistan, Ashgabat, it's clear that there is a very big discrepancy between the population they have, the uh, the GDP they have, I mean, when you start adding up all the ma the metrics of what would what you're what you're seeing in the aesthetic of this city, I mean, it just doesn't match up. Like you're looking at third world uh, statistics, but the outline and and the layout of this place is so futuristic. It looks like it's out of a Hollywood movie with CGI. 
and there's all these Solomon stars everywhere. And it's just really a lot of sacred geometry. It's profound. So I started looking around that surrounding area to other parts uh, that are that are involved in in this uh, you know geographical location, and it seems to be that they are building a future uh, blueprint of lands that might not be affected by the incoming cataclysm. And I'm going to make an assumption that it's that part of the world. And then another part of uh, the assumption I'm making is it's kind of making sense to me right now why they're ritualizing Ukraine. They're doing it on purpose. It's to literally move people out of those lands to mm. get them ready for building and construction of infrastructure that'll be very similar to Ashgabat. So for all we know, that Turkmenistan area, that area of the world with Kazakhstan, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, et cetera, it might be where the, it might be the, the new garden of Eden. Mm. I know this is like wild for me to expose right now because this is like 20, 30, 40 years down the pike, but like it could very well just be. And I don't think the new world order or the apex predator hides anything. They show us exactly what they're doing. Uh, it's all compartmentalized, you know, but that particular place illuminated me to how this could all go. You know, I do think the global elite network are very well aware of how the cataclysm is going to go down. Uh, they have instrumentation to determine the exact time it will happen, where it will affect, how it will affect certain geographical locations. Um, but that place really opened up my eyes. So, yeah, I mean, we're watching this all unfold right now. And when we think about the timeline with Jason's work and what you've just shared about the astrology placements, I mean, we're pretty damn close, but we currently have something to look at, which could be like this futuristic, uh, you know, new world. Well, like, like you said, man, not fearing death is, you know, I mean, if, if a cataclysm comes and wipes us out from a plasma event or whatever, however it looks, if you're one of the ones to make it out in the end, great. If not, well, then you'll change. You may just come back and change characters and try and different meat suit out. Who knows if that's the way this whole thing works. Hey, I would be interested to know the altitude of that city you're talking about that might have everything to do with why they're building there. Mm. Yeah, you're going to want to check out Ashgabat. Like, if I were you, I would investigate that city further. There's so many gems there. Like, e even just looking at Google Maps and going to Ashgabat and then looking at the picture submissions from normal people, mm -hmm. you're going to see some high-level technologies there. Like yeah, what well, people think are just buildings, but they're actually, it's, it's tech. It's highly sophisticated tech that is feeding that is. off of the ether. And uh, it's obvious to me. Well, like it, this it, city it, may be, has... it may be just the upper infrastructure to a whole underground facilities that we don't yep. know about. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what better place to do it than a place that barely has a population to begin with? You know, you want to go to a place where and I and I when I think about the civil war and when I think about the two world wars that we had and I, I really started to investigate them further and started to see uh, where Zionism and Bolshevism and, and Marxism and all of these globalist kind of like uh, the tenets of, of globalism, like where they're systemic of it's starting to make so much sense that this would be part of their planning. This would be part of their protocol. You know, you get people to look this way whilst they're building and developing the infrastructure for the new world. And I'm not talking about for you guys. I'm talking about for them. They could give a shit where you are, you know, and that's up to you and your discernment, your intuition of where you think is a safe place for you to be. Uh, right. And I think we all tap into that through an earlier concept we talked about, which is that information field it comes back to our intuition, you know, where we feel best. I know for me, like around that C-19 event, I was living in Australia, in Melbourne, actually, right before it kicked off. And my intuition was telling me that that place is going to be really hardcore when it comes to the the shutdowns and how they're going to enforce power and enforce this, uh, you know, essence amongst the people. I didn't see it to be as bad as the place that I was living in, the States. And it was a great call, you know, and the people that were in Mexico at the time, an even better call. You know, I mean, I believe you had a lot more, a lot more freedoms and, and mobility, et cetera, but this is going to kind of be the world that we're moving into where they're going to, there's going to be a, a, a lot more of a stranglehold on your mobility, on your rights, 
uh, where you're allowed to go, where you're not allowed to go. I think we all already know about this, though, so it's not to spread fear. But as we inch closer to this year of 2040, if it in fact is going to be a year of a cataclysm, then imagine the 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 shit they're going to try to pull on the world stage as we get closer to that. Just imagine. I mean, it's it's only going to be more and more ramped up. I agree. I, I talk about that a lot on my channel, but also what you're describing to me is a is this this is something that I, I've discussed many times on my channel. The elite are always going to have want to have underground repositories of manufacturing dis districts and all kinds of all kinds of infrastructure already there. And they'll need places to come up from, like these little cities and stuff. In ancient times, this has been religiousized, but really they were just called the Edens. These were walled enclosures of the elite, and they were seen by the locals as paradises after cataclysms because they had lost everything. But these people who operated these Edens, the Anuna, they had come from the deep. They had come down, they had ascended from the mountains. Later on, in Babylonian theocracy, they had changed that to they had descended from the heavens. But that's not the original Sumerian text. The original text is, is they came down, they, they, they descended from the mountains. And sometimes they crossed the sea in fleets. They had passed over the surface of the deep. This is why they were sometimes regarded as half fish, half man. They were always shown with beards and human faces. But... The city you're describing to me would be would be basically the top part of a huge layering of of preparation underground, not to survive the deal. That, that's one use of the facility. The other the other use is is to rapidly take back control from the discombobulated surviving population. Jason, can you just spell out what you called E dense? Yes, it, it's a E period D I N S. It's where Genesis. It's where the Jews. It's where the Jewish scholars, when they were in their Babylonian captivity, had read about the race of the Adamu, and they had created the pronoun Adam, which wasn't originally, uh, which was not originally in the Babylonian writings. They did that themselves. It might have been a misunderstanding. I don't know, but thousands of references in the cuneiform to Adamu all reference mankind. The Jewish scribes turned it into Adam. In those passages, the Adamu were on the outside of the Edens. This is where they got Eden from, this garden paradise. Yeah, that's what I was hearing when you were talking. It's exactly where it derived from. And these are this isn't Jason telling you this. This they're like Albert T. Clay over a century ago wrote about this. This was uh, even Zechariah Sitchin had had mentioned this scenario that Adam and Eve isn't, isn't a true pronoun. Pr true pronouns. These were borrowed from the Babylonian Adamu and Kava. So uh, Kava was just the word, the Semitic Semitic word for females in, in a ma in a matriarchal culture. And the Anuna were not gods. They were regarded as gods by the Adamu. But in every in every visual representation that we have of Sumerian artifacts and in friezes and reliefs, in every single one of them, they look absolutely human. They're very tall. They have pale skin, gemstone colored eyes, and they all have beards. This is the distincting qualifying characteristics of, of the Anuna because the Adamu could not grow facial hair and they prided themselves as the black headed people. So anyway, this uh, yeah, the the Edens were just walled fortresses where the locals knew that's where the candy bars were, that's where the tobacco was, that's where all the good stuff was. <laughs> but they were bringing that they were bringing that up from under underground facilities after a cataclysm. This is the whole story of the Anuna and the Anunnaki. All this other wow. other ancient aliens bullshit falls apart under screw. I've got so many videos that take ancient aliens and Zechariah Sitchin material. And I just dissect it till you realize how ridiculous it is. It's all BS. Yeah. The story of the Anunnaki is the story of a civilized infrastructure that went underground, survived a cataclysm, came back up and rebuilt the world into the civilizations that we know. In yeah. The world. So I just get it back or they just, instead of from the bottom, they came from the top. <laughs> so they just reversed yeah. it. Yeah. Well, it's this is making me think about a couple things. For one, in the Matrix movie where they show you Zion as this underground city, right? There's yeah. that one element. But the second element is it's making me think of Star Forts 
and there's places where these star forts are uh they're surrounded in water it's terraforming human terraforming like it's clearly done by a human intervention mm-hmm. so it's making me think a lot were those island star forts do they have an underground infrastructure that goes down deep into the earth's soil because if that's the case then like holy fuck that is the most sophisticated pre-cataclysm preparation you could possibly have right yeah. you have a land that is guarded by waters and then also it has this kind of geometrical layout wall structure which makes it so that you can militarize it very effectively yeah, you and can then defend ultimately it it's exactly you could defend it really easily but then on the other side you have all of that underground infrastructure that's burrowed deep into the into the surface where it's tunneling systems and you know i've traveled a lot and i'm blown away how there's a similarity that i see in all of these cities it's that they have more developed sophisticated underground tunneling systems than they have above ground streets yeah like when you start looking into some of these places, it'll blow your mind. Like the catac- the catacombs of Paris, France, or in Napoli, uh, Italy, which is one of my favorite places to travel. You can go underground there in tours, and you could see that this is a very sophisticated and developed underground, uh, and and it and it's strategized. Like it's not simple. It is as str- as strategic in the layout as when you start to look at the so called um, ruins of ancient Egypt or Sumeria, Babylon. It is it is amazing. And it's in a city near you. I mean, if you go to New York City, it's the same shit. They just, yep. the exoteric cover-up is your New York subway station. But in actuality, shit gets way more uh, deep than that and really, really um sophisticated beneath. Same thing in Paris, same thing with the London, uh, their uh, metro station. It's just a cover-up. Like their metro station will lead you to secret tunnel systems that'll go even deeper and wow. it'll get, yeah, I mean, then you have the concept of deep underground military bases. I'm sure you guys are well aware of that, but your layer that you added on with uh, the E-Dens, I need to look into that shit, man. That's, I've never heard of that before. So thank you. I, and and having said that, three hours, guys, I don't hit my limit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you needed a shot, dude. <laughs> yeah, I need another shot. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, thanks for you guys have been awesome. This has been a fun uh, podcast, <laughs> a lot of great material. Uh, and um, I really, really am grateful for joining forces with both of you. Thanks for for coming on, sharing your your mindsets or whatever. It's going to be fun to, to to condense down. And I'm not I'm not going to edit anything, ladies and gentlemen. We've completely improved all this. Uh, honestly, like I drafted up some questions before we started, but literally that was this morning. But we improved all this. So this is just a collaboration many of you have been waiting for. Um, so it's been a lot of fun. So we're going to end this transmission now. For uh, Decode Reality, my name's Logan, Jason Brashears from the Archaics family, Jordan from the Waters Above and the Wolf Pack, and that family. Guys, it's been a freaking fun, fun ride. I hope we can come back and do another collaboration. Maybe add another person to this. That would be kind of cool. Add another great mind to this. would be fun. Let's do it. Yeah. So I'll see you guys are open for it. I love it. You don't have to twist your arm, nothing. Just like, let's do it. Yeah. Well, awesome. also, you know, before we started recording, I invited both of y'all to arcades.tv where we can talk about things we can't talk about on YouTube. So we need to do something just like this too, but restricted to things that, you know, we ordinarily censor ourselves. So uh, we'll do that real soon. I'll send y'all emails real soon so we can do one of those. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so that's a wrap for, I don't even know what I'm going to call this, maybe simulation four to make it easy. I'm not sure, but it's been a fun ride. Thanks for joining in. Thanks for all your support. Whatever channel that you're subscribed to, hopefully you subscribe to all three. We share our own mindsets, but we kind of are really similar in a lot of so many areas, but we appreciate each other. We respect each other. It's all about loving here, ladies and gentlemen. Make the truth your own. Got to find your truth, but I appreciate all of you joining in for this podcast. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, we will see you later.